now to our next item of business, which is a debate on motion 13912 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst on bank closures, impact on local businesses, consumers and the Scottish economy. And I would encourage members who wish to speak in today's, uh, this afternoon's debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Gordon Lindhurst to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Economy Committee. <clears throat> Thank you. Jesus cast the money changers out of the temple. And from 1500, that is the year 1500 onwards in continental Europe, 5% was generally considered to be the highest acceptable rate of interest. Everything above that was usury. At least that was until the lenders of Geneva threatened to leave along with their capital. And when that happened, 6.6% became permissible. Sound familiar? Dante wrote the money lenders into his seventh circle of hell. Presiding officer, you'd think by now that bankers might have reviewed their PR strategy. I'm afraid our inquiry found little to help repair the reputation. The rate and scale of bank closures has impacted on people, businesses, and economy. The number of banking premises in Scotland has fallen by a third since 2010. The big five between them have closed 479 branches, the Royal Bank of Scotland topping that table with 235 closures. UK figures show branch branches closing at a rate of 60 a month since 2015. And Edinburgh is the worst hit local authority area in the whole of the UK, having lost 50 branches. Mark Twain may or may not have said, a banker is a man who lends you an umbrella when the weather is fair and takes it away from you when it is raining. But it seems an awful lot of umbrellas are being taken away from us. Reuters' analysis of official UK figures showed 90% of the 600 closures in 2015 to 16, and I quote, were in areas where the median household income is below the British average of 27,600 pounds. In other words, predominantly in poorer areas. Scotland's Towns Partnership told the committee, and again I quote, whenever they decant, that quickly leaves a sense of decline and despair, a toxic legacy. And you don't have to venture far to find an empty former bank building. Number 30, London Road, which is a three minute walk from here, was a branch of Lloyd's TSB until 2011. Since when it's lain empty, little more than a canvas for graffiti and stark visual reminder of a vanished bank. FSB Scotland told us there are 258 more empty units now than two years ago, a blight on many a high street. Our inquiry found no evidence of the banks proactively engaging with communities on what to do with these buildings. Could this be an opportunity to provide for local needs? to bring the generations together, to create co-working spaces, to cater for startups and social enterprises. We want the Scottish Government, councils and the banks to work together to find solutions. But it's not only bricks and mortar being abandoned. Which estimated there are 130 cash deserts in Scotland, areas with no access to a bank or ATM for miles. There are communities feeling forgotten, left behind, written off. The Scottish Grocers Federation criticised what they see as London-centric decision-making. Pete Kima said, I wonder sometimes whether the banks understand Scotland's landscape. The banks themselves told us they don't coordinate their closures to ensure adequate provision in communities. And some of our witnesses promoted the idea of working together to provide a banking hub. Others proposed alternative formats, more flexibility, diversification. Now, a number of the banks seemed sympathetic to these suggestions. Curry Community Council encouraged the banks to show a bit of imagination and make branches more multi-purpose. Creative solutions have occasionally been found elsewhere. Newcastle Building Society opened a branch in a library that would otherwise have closed. Some witnesses argued that banks should be subsidized to keep unprofitable rural branches going. 
Another proposed the model of Germany's community banks, the Sparkasse, as an option. So there are many ideas, but the scale and speed of the closures demands urgencies. We therefore invite the Scottish Government to call a summit with the high street banks to consider all possible solutions, including shared banking hubs, and indeed to report back to us with their outcomes. We accept that customer behaviour is changing. The committee, of course, recognises this. 71% of the population now bank online. 22 million of us now use mobile banking apps. Seven out of 10 people see the bank as something to carry around in their pocket. And according to UK Finance, debit card payments overtook cash for the first time in 2017. Is cash really still king? Well, compare London with rural Scotland. The difference is striking. In the former, that is London, cash makes up 55% of retail sales. In the latter, that is rural Scotland, the figure edges 80%. FSB Scotland contrasted claims of a soon-to-be cashless society with what their membership told them. Namely, that cash was absolutely central to how they operate. Barry McCulloch said, and I quote, we honestly find it difficult to digest the bank's perspective. So there are plenty of people and places still dependent on cash and who either can't or won't join the digital revolution. Citizens Advice Scotland estimated 20% of consumers are not online. This is particularly the case in rural areas with poor broadband and mobile, and that is poor mobile coverage. Older customers, disabled people, the vulnerable, and those living in our more deprived areas. A postmaster told us, waking up in the morning with a sense of purpose, something to do, a place to go, is really important for many elderly and lonely citizens. And Age Scotland, Scottish Rural Action and Unite all made similar points. Disability Equality Scotland were critical of mobile banking vans. In a survey of their members, 81% felt these banks on wheels were not a suitable alternative to the high street branch. So it is crucial that these communities continue to have access to bank accounts and financial services, including cash. Yes, certainly. Sandra White. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Linters. It was just on the, the issue of people being, having access, and you mentioned post offices. Uh, certainly in very many areas, the post offices unfortunately, or fortunately become the local bank and socially for, for vulnerable people. Will you include looking at post offices when you ask the Scottish Government to have an inquiry into that? Because it seems that the post offices, while they're providing the service, are not getting the same remuneration as a bank would. Gordon Lindhurst. Yes, well, well, thank you for that intervention. The post offices and these issues that you raise were in fact looked at by the committee and covered in the, the inquiry report. And uh, certainly that uh, is an issue and a live one in terms of banking service provision once banks leave an area. So certainly that, that was covered. Um, and the committee believes that there must be universal banking provision where there is the need or desire. We recommend then that the UK government's newly established financial inclusion policy forum address these issues, that they consider how people can continue to access cash and other banking services in the wake of all the closures in Scotland. The impact of closures looks certain to be compounded by reduced access to free ATMs. Somewhere between 300 and 700 could close in Scotland. FSB Scotland pointed us to research showing that a third of high street spend depends on the availability of an ATM. They are a lifeline to many communities. We recommend to the UK government that ATM provision be given independent oversight. Presiding officer Adam Smith is meant to have said, all money is a matter of belief. Um, the veracity of that quote is questionable unless you count a fridge magnet reliable. 
But the banks have certainly tested our belief in how seriously they take customer views. They told us it is our behavior and demand driving branch closures. It's apparent, however, that the banks themselves are pushing the pace of change. And we question how they can know what the customers want without consulting them. In our own survey, 90% of business respondents said closures have or will have an impact on productivity. Personal banking may be in decline, but the commercial side appears to be less so. The Scottish Grocers Federation said, and I quote, banks have not done full analyses, which is where they have failed. And the FSB Scotland reported low awareness and confidence in the access to banking standard. They called it a paper tiger. Citizens Advice Scotland said it failed to find out about the effect on local people. Others called it a shamble, a charade, a tick box exercise. We found the standard was failing to ensure the consideration of all relevant impacts on the local economy. That it reflected the interests of the banks, not customers and businesses. Banks should be required to consult with customers, businesses and the community before deciding to close a branch. And the standard ought to be replaced by a statutory model including a stipulation to consult. We invite the UK government to consider these findings, bearing in mind that banking and financial services are reserved. Our inquiry took evidence from banks, businesses, community groups, equality bodies, unions, the post office, which, and link. We organized focus groups with the good people of Mintlaw, Dalmellington, and Leven. We issued a call for views and a survey to which more than 700 individuals and businesses responded. We cannot claim, though, to have formed a full picture of the overall impact of bank closures. A systematic study, not only in Scotland, but across the UK, would be most timely. A response from the UK Treasury, along with letters from the Scottish Government, the banks and others, arrived yesterday. The tone and tenor are not terribly surprising. There's a good deal of agreement with much of what we found but something of an absence to solid commitments. I leave my colleagues, should they wish, to pick up the details or other aspects of the report and the evidence that we considered as a committee. Bill Gates said, your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. On that basis, presiding officer, the wisdom of the banks must be beyond doubt. I move the motion. Thank you. I now call on Kate Forbes to open for the Government, to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Gordon Linters for raising today's motion on behalf of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Works Committee. And it's to the credit of the committee that this report can now be quoted alongside Mark Twain, Dante and Jesus. Um, and I, th I think it has been an impressive um, piece of work um, to highlight the issue of bank branch closures and to provide a platform for consumers, businesses and communities to express their concerns and fears. The lengthy list of written evidence, those who gave written evidence and verbal evidence, I think demonstrates the strength of feeling and the scale of feeling right across sectors in Scotland. Communities are now feeling the effects of the closures announced at the end of last year, leaving many areas with significantly reduced branch, branch coverage. Um, and it, provides uh, another evidence base along with reports done by Highlands and Islands Enterprise to uh, back up that anecdotal strength of feeling. The RBS closures that prompted the committee's interest were the latest in a series of closures and this is an issue that affects of course all banks and therefore finding solutions and as Gordon Linter has talked about concrete tangible actions to respond to that feeling must be the responsibility of all banks. It's not just about resolving the challenges that we currently face and that communities are facing across Scotland, but in light of additional announcements that have been made since December's announcement, albeit not in Scotland, it's likely that this continues to be a challenge that banks must resolve. The worst impact is of course felt by rural communities, small businesses and by the most vulnerable in society. For, whom, for many of whom going into a branch remains the only feasible way to conduct their banking. 
And the key message for me in all of this is whilst banking needs are changing and there are new ways to bank, customers still require choice. And those who don't want or can't manage that digital options should not be left behind. Digital progress is a great opportunity to be more inclusive. And yet with some of these closures, digital progress has been seen as exclusive. And that is not right. As the committee makes clear, the UK government retains legislative and regulatory responsibility for banking. And I've noted the calls by the committee to the UK government to act and respond in different ways. The Scottish government has said from the outset that it remains ready to work with UK ministers, with banks and with other stakeholders to support customers and communities in light of these closures. And my predecessor, Paul Wheelhouse, raised the issue of closures with the Economic Secretary to the Treasury uh, within days of the announcement, pressing the case for access to essential banking services to be maintained. And we have publicly and clearly called on banks to consider the needs of Scotland's communities and especially the needs of the most vulnerable members of those communities who still need choice. I appreciate that the banks must operate on a commercial basis and that they will take decisions on the provision of services to customers in that context. However, the banking system must meet the needs of all users. It cannot leave users behind. It has a duty of care to all users. And while some will want and choose to use digital options, there are many who cannot, and they cannot be left behind. The committee has asked the UK government to consider whether an independent impact assessment, including the impact on local economies, should be carried out before a decision is made. And that's often been an issue that's been raised with me, both as a constituency MSP and as a minister, that individuals who use banks don't feel like there was sufficient consultation or sufficient information or sufficient opportunity to shape the decisions that banks took. The committee asked, asked the UK government to replace the access to banking standard with a statutory model. And I and the Scottish government agree with the committee's call for a review of the access to banking standard because there needs to be a channel by which customers can shape and influence banks' decisions on the local provision of services. I will. John Mason. Uh, I thank the minister very much for giving way. I mean, the banks have been arguing that they cannot do consultation before they close, which I struggle to understand because before schools close or anything else, there's consultation. Is she convinced by the bank's argument that they couldn't do consultation? Minister. I think there is definitely scope for banks to engage more in advance of a decision that's made rather than just informing those who use the bank after it has been made. The standard um, that has been referenced is incorrectly perceived by many to be a model of consultation with communities and bank branch closures, but it's just a set of guidelines at the moment on what information will be presented to customers in the event of a closure decision. And there currently remains no channel by which customers can influence the bank's decisions. And in my co conversations with those who depend on face-to-face -face, uh, access, they're not demanding that there is no change or no progress. What they are saying is that their needs need to be recognised. And I fundamentally believe that you bank users' needs must be recognised. Those who want to use digital services, that's fine. But for the others, there needs to be a means by which they are not left behind. And that has to happen before a decision is taken, not just being informed after a decision is taken. In terms of the, the committee's point around a forum on banking, which I think is a, is a very interesting suggestion, the committee asked the Scottish Government to call a summit. And as I said at the beginning, because this is an issue that affects all banks, any solution must involve all banks, and therefore they all need to be round the table. Earlier this year, the Scottish Government convened a round table discussion between the main Scottish banks on the issue of branch closures and the provision of banking services. And the commitment that I can make is to continue to engage with the banks on this issue and in a wider discussion on the role of banking and financial services in supporting Scotland's communities, because there is a whole host of needs out there that need to be recognised. Moving on to rural communities who are particularly affected by the recent closures, we've established a rural community liaison group made up of rural parliament representatives, including Scottish Rural Action, SCVO, the Consumer Council, DTAS, HIE and Rural Academies. 
The group has discussed their shared concerns around banking services at a meeting in August, the month just passed, and are considering solutions for rural communities. And that brings me on to another point around community groups who have an important role to play in identifying solutions and ensuring the future provision of banking services meets the needs of consumers and businesses across Scotland. And I will continue to engage with these groups to understand and address their concerns. In terms of um, town centres, uh, branches often, we'll know it ourselves from our own constituencies, have a prominent place in high streets and their presence is seen by many as a visible sign of the health of the local economy. And we want our towns and town centres to be vibrant, creative, enterprising and accessible. So we need to promote and support the regeneration of Scotland's towns and town centres, including our small towns in rural areas. I want to specifically touch on uh, digital before I close, because I'm also the Minister for the Digital Economy. Choice remains essential. We under I understand that customers choose to access banking services in different ways, but the problem here has been the speed of change and change which leaves people behind. There are exciting new ways to support businesses and retail customers with services. Uh, just on Friday, I was talking to uh, branch staff about ways that they can use to intervene on fraud and on scams. But not all customers are able to take advantage of these servers, services. And there's no point in pretending that everybody is digital. They are not. And there remain circumstances in which many customers need or prefer to access face-to-face -face services. Advances in digital technology are changing the way we do so many different things, but people cannot be left behind and the pace of change needs to reflect customers' need. We've, I've seen many local examples of branch staff supporting customers and using new devices and apps to access services. And there's a duty to educate customers to ensure that no one is left behind before branches are closed. And that's the key message here, that it's not about standing in the way of change. It's about taking people with you, ensuring there is choice and not leaving the most vulnerable to just pick up the pieces and figure out how they should catch up with everybody else. And there's been talk in the um, report around alternative providers, post offices, and I do welcome the work that the banks are already doing with the post office to expand the services available to their customers. Particularly in rural areas, it's an opportunity for post offices to work with um, banks and to ensure that the post office remains open. But again, there needs to be adaptations, we need to ensure that there's opportunity for private conversations, they need to be accessible, and these discussions need to happen again before the branches are closed. So in summary, I think this is a, a good report. I think it's a fair contribution to the debate. It demonstrates the need of some customers for face-to-face, -face, and there's an obligation on the banks to ensure that those customers are not left behind. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call on Dean Lockhart to open for the Conservative Party, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, first of all, let me thank colleagues from the committee for bringing forward uh, this report for debate. And I thank the convener for his opening uh, remarks, as well as his number of different quotes, which uh, helps to set out the context for the debate this afternoon. I also join others in thanking the clerks to the committee and SPICE for all their hard work in preparing the report. Today's debate is timely. This week marks the 10th anniversary of the financial crisis. And the committee heard evidence that the structure of the banking sector, the regulatory regime, and the relationship between banks and their customers have changed fundamentally following the crisis. In my contribution, I want to cover two main areas, the impact of bank branch closures on individuals and businesses across Scotland, and the related issue of the declining coverage of ATM networks. With respect to bank branch closures, the committee heard evidence that technology and changing customer habits are having an impact on how banks and their customers interact. Martin Kearsley of the Post Office explained the banks are currently undergoing what he described as a once in a generation change. And this is reflected in the way in which we all consume banking services in a different fashion these days. The speed of change is reflected in the growth of online banking, 
cashless transactions and the ongoing revolution in fintech. Cashless transactions now account for less than 50% of all transactions, with the level of cash transactions in Scotland declining 11% in the past year alone. As we've heard from other members, these trends have resulted in banks cutting back their branch networks in unprecedented numbers. To illustrate the scale of the branch closures recently, the Federation of Small Business has estimated that in 2013, there were more than 1,100 bank branches in Scotland, but this figure will drop to between 700 or 750 by the end of this year. Presenting officer, it's important that we acknowledge the changing nature of banking and the pressures that banks face, with interest rates lower for longer, increasing regulatory compliance, and increasing costs of doing business. However, cost reduction exercises that result in the closure of hundreds of bank branches across Scotland cannot and should not be the answer to these pressures. The reality is that we are not yet a cashless society and the scale and the speed of recent branch closures has had a negative impact on those most reliant on cash. And this is what the evidence uh, the committee heard from a range of different stakeholders about the impact of branch closures. Concern was expressed by many that closures are having an adverse impact on vulnerable and deprived communities. Age Scotland expressed concern that poor mobility and the lack of public transport will make it difficult for older people to access branches which are more distant. For small retailers, the closure of a local bank branch can have a damaging impact on their business. Small retailers are primarily cash businesses. According to the Scottish Grocers Federation, 76% of its members' uh, business uh, are cash-based. So as a result, many small retailers rely on their local bank for their business needs, and many face insurance requirements to deposit cash at the end of every day of their business. Without having a local bank, these retailers often have to travel two to three uh, hours to get to their nearest branch, which has an impact on their business, on their productivity, and how they uh, manage their business. Uh, the committee also heard evidence that bank uh, branch closures have a disproportionate impact in rural areas with people living in rural areas having to travel around 40 minutes on average to their uh, bank, often having to use public transport, which itself is experiencing cutbacks. I'm sure members across Parliament will have heard these concerns raised in their own constituencies and regions. In my own region of Mid-Scotland and Fife, I have heard concerns from communities across Bannockburn, Comrie, Dunblane, Leven, Anstruther uh, and Alloa, areas which have all experienced recent <coughs> bank uh, branch closures. Yeah, yes, I will. Keith Brown. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank Dean Lockhart, Dean Lockhart for taking intervention and also say that in relation to Dunblane and Alloa, which of course is my constituency, which has no Clydesdale and no RBS branches left at all, I think the only constituency in Scotland, would, would he join me in saying the remedy here lies with the regulating authority, the UK government, which also happens to be the biggest shareholder in RBS, and would he condemn the complete failure of the two local Tory MPs to make any impact in reversing some of these decisions? Dean Lockhart. Uh, well, thank Keith Brown for that intervention. With regard to the UK government and its shareholding in RBS, RBS, as you know, is an independent listed company, so it's uh, legally not possible for the government uh, under uh, London Stock Exchange listing rules to interfere with the independent board of, of RBS. Um, the other evidence we heard uh, at the committee, while the uh, evidence was largely negative of the impact of bank branch closures, some evidence highlighted that it only has a limited effect. Professor Griggs uh, told the committee that, in his words, there is no long-term empirical evidence to show that there is an, an, an adverse effect on bank branch closures. But that has to be said, that was uh, in the minority of the evidence we received. So taking into account all the evidence presented, uh, the committee reached the following conclusions. First, many people have indeed experienced negative impact from bank closures. There's no doubt that the rate and the scale of bank closures have adversely affected people and businesses in a number of different ways. However, the committee felt it wasn't in a position to build a comprehensive picture of the overall impact across Scotland. From the evidence we heard, it's clear there is an urgent need for a systematic study of the impact of bank closures on people and business in Scotland and indeed across uh, the UK. Such a study would map out the current provision of banking services and more importantly, what future provision would look like so that there is a universal banking provision in all areas of Scotland. These are issues that involve policy areas which are both 
reserved and devolved. So this is an area in which we call on the Scottish Government to work together with the UK Government to ensure we have a better understanding of the current and the future banking needs in Scotland. Let me move on to uh, the ATM coverage because um, the customers are also having to deal with a, uh, the threat of a declining ATM network in Scotland. Uh, the importance of local ATMs has only increased following closure of bank branches as ATMs are now often the only means for people across Scotland to access cash and banking services. Uh, given the importance of ATMs, there was real concern uh, earlier this year when the UK's largest cash point network linked announced plans to change the fee structure under which ATM operators are paid. Given these concerns, I led a members debate in this chamber in May and the Economy Committee here in Holyrood, along with the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster, have heard evidence of the impact that these changing fee structures would have on ATM provision. It was therefore a positive development to hear that in July, Link announced that the planned third cut to the interchange fee to 21.25 pence in January 2020 has been cancelled and the fourth reduction, taking the fees down to 20 pence, is now on hold pending a review. I think a good example of how uh, here and in other places we can influence decision making uh, with a regulator. It's clear that any assessment that we have called for for banking services have to look at the availability of bank branch networks and ATMs in the round. They go hand in hand. Reflecting this, the committee's conclusion with respect to ATM provision in the future was clear. The committee recommended that the ATM network should have independent oversight and that the provision of ATMs should be included in any revised statutory arrangements put in place following revision of the access to banking standard. Uh, presiding officer, let me conclude by emphasising that the committee will continue to monitor developments in this area. Uh, Gordon Gecko, not Gordon Lindhurst, said that money never sleeps, and this is an issue that the committee will remain wide awake on. We look forward to receiving a positive response from all key stakeholders involved and both the Scottish Government and the UK Government with respect to the recommendations set out in the report. Thank you very much. I now call on Jackie Bailey to open for the Labour Party to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and let me start by declaring an interest. I bank with the Royal Bank of Scotland. I've done so for the past 40 years, and whilst my comments relate to other banks, I am going to talk about my bank in particular because I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed that despite the wave upon wave of branch closures, the withdrawal of support from many of our businesses, the real anger at creating cash deserts in many of our communities, the Royal Bank carry on regardless. And whilst the Royal Bank of Scotland is not alone, the hollowness of their claims of being the last bank in town leaves a sour taste in the mouth. The scale of the closures have been breathtaking. No wonder RBS was reticent about sharing the numbers with the committee. They started with 334 branches. They now have 99, a staggering 70% reduction, the highest of all the banks. TSB had the fewest closures with a reduction though of 18%. So RBS has gone from the bank with the most branches to third place. And the reason RBS and other banks are content to carry on and not adjust their behavior in response to our concerns is because, let's face it, of the stickiness of their customers. We, their customers, we don't like change. We tend not to leave the bank. Yet it's fair to say that not very many of us are particularly happy. Now I wonder, if we started switching banks as we are encouraged to do with other utilities, whether that would make them sit up and listen. I wonder if there is a comparison site that we can use for different banking products. But during the committee's inquiry, we were constantly told that the customers are changing, their needs are changing. We live in a digital age. People want online banking. We want speed, we want convenience, and apparently we don't want to visit branches anymore. The committee heard that this was not the case for the majority of older or vulnerable people. Well, I clearly must be old because I like visiting my bank branch. I'm not alone, as the queues will testify, nor, presiding officer, am I the youngest person there. 
There are people of all ages in my local branch, and I'm joined in those queues by local businesses. And you know, I keep asking myself, if bank branches are so unpopular and so undated, why are there always queues when I happen to visit? Now, Pete Cheemer of the Scottish Grocers Federation told the committee that the needs of commercial banking appear to have been completely ignored. Bank branches have closed due to an apparent decline in personal banking, but that's not the case with commercial banking where demand has not reduced at all. Yet it seems that their real need for cash is a secondary consideration. That's what businesses told us. Firstly, although debit cards have for the first time overtaken cash, cash remains the second most frequent form of payment. My colleague here, Colin, was telling me how he was caught in an embarrassing situation. Um, I know he's going to hate the fact that I'm going to repeat it, um, where he was treating people for a cup of tea, but there was no machine for his card. He needed cash. They had a whip round to pay for that. Um, he does tell me that he's going to treat them all in future, and I'm sure they will hold him to that. But in the retail sector, 76% of businesses use cash. FSB Scotland report that cash remains the most popular payment method for their members. That means that businesses need a facility to deposit cash and to get change. The consequence of branches closing has meant that businesses need to travel further to bank. It takes more time. And some even pay as much as £8,000 a year for a pickup, a collection service. And with less frequent deposits, more money retained by the store, the risk increases, and so do the insurance premiums. Now, I watched an advert last night from RBS. The strap line was one of the many ways you can bank with RBS. I commend it to the chamber, because what you would see is a mobile van, a cash, a cash machine outside a chippy, Honest Angus with his sheep, I'm not sure what he was supposed to symbolize, and Dodgy Davy with a face recognition mobile app. What you didn't see, and I watched it twice just to make sure, was a branch. Not anywhere, clearly so passe, they are now wiped out of adverts completely. We were told about alternatives when we considered this at the committee. Post offices were suggested, but don't forget there's been a program of post office closures. There is also an upper limit on the value of individual transactions, which is not helpful to commercial customers. Then there are mobile branches, undoubtedly useful in very rural and remote areas. Some customers, though, have raised concerns about disability access. For many of them, their main concern is frequency. Instead of a branch that they could call into any time, they get a van, which stops for an hour once a fortnight. And in my area, it took 18 months after closing the Alexandria branch for RBS to decide to provide us with a mobile van, for which I'm grateful. But what about ATMs? That same Alexandria branch that closed had an ATM. It has a history of breaking down and being out of action. And we are told that the trend with branch close closures will soon be the trend with ATMs as banks and other providers remove free ATMs from our communities. Link is reducing the ATM charge, which might lead to a loss of machines. Now, Link told us that they're committed to maintaining free ATMs in rural and deprived areas, and that's a good thing. They also told us that they'll maintain a free ATM in every community that currently has one by protecting the interchange rate for all existing free ATMs within one kilometer of another. That's actually quite far away, and particularly in a rural area, that might mean that some don't have ATMs at all. So having illustrated the impact on personal customers, on commercial businesses, and on our high streets, what can we do? Well, I agree with the call for independent oversight of ATMs. We need to stop the withdrawal of them now before it becomes a trend in the way that bank branch closures have become. Of course, encouraging the development of financial institutions like credit unions, expanding common bond areas, um, and ensuring that an increased range of financial services are important. The Scottish Government can help by providing the infrastructure and development support so that we can grow that network. The committee, as you've already heard, recommended that the Scottish Government should convene a summit to look at the options to protect customers um, and protect our high streets. And I hope the Minister responds positively to that. 
But let me turn, as I finish, presiding officer, to the access to banking code. Set up as a voluntary code by the UK government and industry, there are at least two major flaws with it. The first, that it applies to consultation after the bank has decided to close the branch, not before, but after. There is little chance of meaningful community input. It is simply an exercise in telling you what the alternatives are. I don't think it's made a material difference to the outcome of any proposed branch closure. And the second problem with it is that it's voluntary. There's no requirement to do this, and for some it appears to be a tick box exercise. Now, people tell me that we can't interfere in the decisions of banks because they are private companies. I didn't see anyone saying that when we were bailing out the banks with billions of pounds of taxpayers' money. Indeed, the last time I looked, the taxpayer still owns the majority shareholding in the Royal Bank of Scotland. Interesting that whilst they are happy to accept our interference and help from the taxpayer, they don't want to offer us anything in exchange. The consultation should be upfront before a decision is made, and that is exactly what Scottish Labour and the UK Labour Party believes that the access to banking code should do. It should be given statutory underpinning. There should be mandatory consultations on bank branch closures before decisions are made. Presiding officer, it is dis disappointing that the people who caused the crisis are not the ones who will suffer the consequences. Instead, what we have is ordinary people suffering the loss of bank branches on their high streets. And I hope the Scottish Government and UK Government act in the interests of our communities. Thank you. I call Mike Rumbles before we move to the open part of the debate. Mike Rumbles. Well, like Jackie Bailey, I, I was a customer of RBS. But unlike Jackie Bailey, I'm no longer one of their customers. And perhaps I'll explain why in my contribution. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Economy and Jobs and Fair Work Committee for producing the report, which we're debating, their remit, and it's worth looking at the remit again, to examine the impact of bank branch closures in Scotland on local businesses, consumers, and the Scottish economy, and to explore what steps can be taken to address any issues identified by the committee. That's a really important remit. Now, over the last few years, as we've heard, our banks have steadily withdrawn their presence from particularly rural Scotland. This has to have had a major impact on the ability of our small businesses and individual customers to conduct their financial affairs. Now, the impact came home to me as a resident of rural Aberdeenshire, and rather than use the anecdotal evidence of any of my constituents, because I wouldn't want to name them, I'll use my own experience as an example. Traveling from my home in Kildrummy, some seven miles from Afford, my nearest village with a bank, I used at the time the branch of the Royal Bank of Scotland to pay in our business takings. In September 2015, they closed the branch and advised me that I could easily use either their Bankery branch, some 26 miles away, or their West Hill branch, some 27 miles away from my home. I declined to do this, but I do know many people who moved their accounts. Can you imagine how those customers, the ones that moved their accounts, felt, well, in September last year, RBS closed its bankery branch and quickly followed again the next month by closing its West Hill branch. Never mind, the, the nearest RBS branch was in Huntley, just 21 miles north of Afford. So what did RBS do just eight months later? Yes, you've guessed it, presiding officer. They closed down their Huntley branch too. So those people who had moved from all of those branches over those three years when RBS closed all four down. If anybody wanted to do face-to-face -face banking, they had to visit their traveling bank, and we've just heard about those, and in my case, take the 66-mile round trip to Aberdeen. You know, I have to ask whether it would have been more sensible to have closed all of these branches down at the same time. I know he wouldn't have liked it, but would it not have been more and more sense rather than mess all those people about jumping from branch to branch over those three years. So anecdotally, the difficulties faced by small businesses and individuals was obvious. What we needed was evidence-based and an evidence-based investigation into those difficulties, and that's why I'm pleased to see that the committee has taken up the challenge. I welcome their conclusions. They state, one, that the 
most vulnerable in our communities are most affected. Two, that there are indeed difficulties being experienced by community groups and charities in particular, church groups in particular, in accessing banking services with their collections in cash. That cash is still essential for some businesses and that these closures have impacted on productivity which will impact on Scotland's economy as a whole. Now, we all know that regulation of our banks is a reserved matter for the UK government and the UK Parliament, of course. So it didn't surprise me to see that there weren't that many recommendations produced in the committee's report. Its main recommendation, and I quote, to ask the UK government to urgently carry out a study on the impact of bank closures across the UK, it is welcome, but it does indicate to me something of a lost opportunity. Now, I wasn't privy to the discussion surrounding the decision by the committee to proceed with the investigation they have in the way that it has. Obviously, those discussions take place in private session. So I hope that members of the committee, and perhaps the convener, will forgive me if you've already examined what I'm about to say and decided that it was either too difficult or too impractical to proceed in this way. But considering banking and financial services is a reserve matter, would this not have been an ideal opportunity for our two parliaments, here at Holyrood and at Westminster, to work together on an inquiry to produce a joint report? I would really like to know if the committee explored this opportunity. I'm, I'm happy to, to listen in the further contribution or even take an intervention. I'm delighted. Thank you. Julian Martin. I'm sure the member will be aware that the, the Scottish Affairs Committee actually did uh, do its own inquiry. Um, and there were some of the th issues that they, they discussed, which they didn't take forward, which was an opportunity for us to, to fill in the gaps as it were. So I, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, that having happened. Mike yeah, Grumbles. I, I thank Julian and Martin for that intervention, and I am indeed aware of that. But I actually think it's important on an issue like this, which is a reserve matter for regulation and has such an impact on devolved matters, that we could have been a little bit more, dare I say it, adventurous in, in working together. Now, I don't know if that was examined by the committee, and I'd like to think it would be, but it, surely it is a lesson, perhaps, when we look to the future, to, see, to examine whether we could, in fact, work together in the two parliaments that represent the people of Scotland. I think that would be ideal, because I'm looking for practical recommendations, and um, I, I realize I'm running out of time, so basically, as I say, I, I don't want to be too harsh on the, on the committee, not at all. I think the committee have done a good report, and I can see the convener smiling. I hope I'm not being sounding too critical. Um, but it, it, I do actually think it was a missed opportunity to break new ground, and I think we should be interested in breaking new ground. And uh, let's be a little bit more adventurous because we could address the issues that the committee have identified in practical ways and do it together. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the open part of the debate, and I call Keith Brown to be followed by Edward Mountain. Keith Brown. I welcome the publication of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee's report into the closure programme, which I think correctly identifies the significant negative impact this will have for communities such as those facing bank closures in my own constituency. Those closures will, as I've mentioned, make the Clipmanager and Dumblain constituency the only one, I believe, in Scotland without an RBS or a Clydesdale branch and many of my constituents will rightly ask why their Westminster parliamentary representatives failed to take any effective action to oppose these closures. At various explanations, as we've heard, have been offered by the banks to account for these closures. I'm less concerned, as Dean Lockhart was, to, re to recognise the pressures that the banks face. I'm much more inclined to think about the pressures that my constituents face. Since 2010, Clydesdale Bank and RBS have closed 53% and 70% of their branches, respectively. And it's fair to say those closures have occurred without prior consultation with businesses or the communities they were supposed to serve. And on the 1st of December 2017, RBNS, RBS announced its intention to close 62 branches across Scotland, leading to the loss of 158 jobs. Of course, the closures would result in the loss of the last branch in town for many communities, contrary to the commitment given by RBS in 2010 with the Tory UK government taking no interest and no position on the closures, despite its majority ownership of RBS with taxpayers' money. 
In my uh, constituency, three branches of RBS in Alloa, Bridge of Allen and Dunblane were earmarked for closure. Instead of demanding action from the RBS owning Tory government, the two Tory MPs currently representing these areas fell into line and backed the inaction and indifference of the UK government, which had absolutely nothing to delay or halt these closures, despite having a majority ownership of RBS. It is clear to me that little thought has been given to the impacts that these closures have upon communities. I will do. Dean Lockhart. I just wanted to repeat the discussion I, we had uh, earlier about uh, legally the UK government not being able to interfere with the RBS uh, independent board decisions. Is, is that something uh, Keith Brown acknowledges? Keith Brown. Uh, I think as Jackie Bailey mentioned earlier on, given the extent of powers held by the UK government, is their powers held in terms of regulation and banking? And given the stakeholder, the taxpayer stakeholder you have in RBS, there is plenty of scope for action for the UK government to take, and it's chosen to take no action at all. Otherwise, why would some of your colleagues have asked the UK government to take action? So I think that proves it is perfectly possible. And it quite rightly notes the report that it's vulnerable, it's the vulnerable in our communities who stand to be most affected by bank branch closures. And at a time as well when benefit reforms being imposed by the Tory UK government are causing such damage to so many vulnerable people in the constituencies we represent, and placing such emphasis on people's ability to manage their own finances effectively, if you think only of the uh, universal credit changes, I recently held a summit where, again, the two Tory MPs refused to attend and the DWP didn't even respond to the invitation to come along. Uh, the fact that people are being asked to take more responsibility for their money surely means that bank branches being closed is particularly perverse and unwelcome. Uh, the committee report notes that with the changes in banking provision, it's vital that people continue to have access to financial services, to financial support and to cash. And it's those who have limited access to bank accounts, indeed the unbanked as they're called, and cards who are risk at the most risk of being excluded. And that's an important finding, one that as a parliament we have to press the UK government for action on. Uh, following my own discussions with RBS about the impact of the closure programme in my constituency, I was assured that post offices offer many of the face-to-face -face services offered by banks and that therefore communities facing bank closures would not see the loss of services to the extent that was feared. But in Alloa, for example, which is the main town and club manager, a decision was taken to close a dedicated Crown post office with reduced services moved to a few counters inside a local shop. That post office is extremely busy with long queues common at peak times and a lack of privacy for people and businesses to discuss what after all should be private concerning their personal finance matters. And as Jackie Bailey also mentioned, there's a 2,000 pound deposit limit for walk-in transactions and businesses that wanted to make deposits greater than 2,000 pounds have to arrange for cash to be deposited at a pre-arranged time. Not exactly a flexible service that's accountable uh, for the varying needs of businesses. So I think it's unfair fair to suggest that post offices offer a comparable alternative to a bank branch for either personal or business uh, customers. I should say, Mike Rumble said that we should be more adventurous. Well, I'll make a suggestion that might not be feasible, but why do the public authorities in Scotland, local councils, other public authorities say, well, we think it's quite important we have a physical presence that provides banking services. We think it's important that we provide physical, uh, sorry, financial education. We think it's important that we don't have somebody on universal credit to get two buses from Alloa into Stirling so they can pick up a universal credit payment. So because of that, we will set up our own bank. We will put our deposits and our monies into a community bank, which then can be available, can be accessed through different physical premises in the constituencies and the areas around Scotland and allow people to have that level of control. If the banks want to create these deserts and they've created one in Club Manager in Dunblane, then it's time for us to irrigate the system again. And why can't some public authorities look to that? I just mention it as a suggestion. And also in Dunblane, in my constituency, a community organisation approached RBS with the hope of taking over the premises when it became vacant. They hoped to use the premises for a social enterprise which focused on employability skills and training, including financial training. However, disappointingly, the response from RBS was that the building would be put in the open market before considering the community's request. As has been the case across Scotland, the reaction in Club Manager in Dunblane has been overwhelmingly negative, and that includes amongst business owners who rely on the convenience of local banking services. In February, I received a response from the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, John Glenn, which stated that the government, the UK government, does believe that banks should act in the best interest of their customers. However, it's clear from the evidence that this simply is not the case, and I fully endorse the calls of the committee that the UK government must carry out a further study into the impact of bank closures with a view to identifying the statutory and regulatory changes required which will ensure the wider impacts are fully considered and in the best interests of customers and communities.
Thank you. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Gillian Martin. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for their report on bank closures. I don't need to remind anyone that it was nearly a decade ago that retail banks committed themselves to restoring the consumer confidence which they had lost during the financial crash of 2009. Banks set out to rebuild that vital relationship with local communities and local businesses. And the RBS, I have to admit, my bank, even boasted in an advert that it was here for you wherever you may live. Back then, RBS had the most branches across Scotland, and more than any other bank. How times have changed. Since 2010, RBS have closed 235 local branches, a 70% reduction. That bank, sorry, that is the bank that promised it would not shut the last branch in a town, and it's just doing that right now. To quote the committee, this was clearly a hollow promise. Now, the Highlands and Islands region will be one of the hardest hit areas with about 52 bank closures in the region. Branches along with their ATMs have already been closed in Malik, Nairn, Aviemore, Granton on Spey, Inverness, Tain and Wick. Three branches in Bewley, Kyle and Tongue are still threatened with closure, but have a stay of execution pending an independent review by Johnston Carmichael. If the independent review advises those branches remain open, then we are told the RBS will honour that recommendation. I would welcome that, but a consultation should have happened long before RBS made their initial decision to close the branches. Therefore, I welcome the committee's conclusion that access to banking standard is failing in its current form and recommends it's replaced with a statutory model which makes it a requirement for banks to consult before a decision is made to close a branch. Whilst it's true many, use, many more people use digital banking these days, having a branch on your local high street is still important and more important than ever, especially in rural communities in the Highlands which remain unconnected to superfast broadband. Let's not forget the Highlands was meant to have superfast broadband by the end of this parliament. Under this government, Highlanders will have to wait until at least the end of 2021 for superfast broadband, a target that may slip further. So for many, internet banking is still a dream. Homes and businesses left in the digital slow lane cannot access digital banking. And when digital banking is not available, banks are keen to stress that mobile banking is the next best option. But is it? As this report highlights, many retail banks such as TSB and Santander don't have mobile vans. And those that do, such as RBS, are cutting the time they spend at each location they visit. Last May, stops in King Usi were cut from 45 minutes to 20 minutes, and from 30 minutes to 15 minutes in Boat of Garden. Even more concerning is the fact that some of the vans are not accessible to people with reduced mobility. I therefore welcome the committee's recommendation that RBS must review the disabled access to its vans as a matter of priority. I also share the committee's concerns regarding the post office's ability to fill the gap left by banks. There is great potential when it comes to providing basic retail banking service in post office, but that does not help business banking. Services such as check clearing are often processed more slowly and inter-account transfers and currency exchange are not always available. As the regional chair of the Federation of Small Businesses of the Highlands and Islands stated last year, business needs somewhere to bank cash, but neither the post office nor mobile vans, uh, the latter only visiting once or twice a week, would suffice. Business and customers need the reassurance of local banks a local bank branch alongside, alongside a first-class digital service. There's no reason why they shouldn't get the best of both worlds. Presiding officer, I accept the way we bank is changing, but as the report states, banks are also driving the pace of change. They do so, I believe, without comprehending the impact of their, on their customers in the remote rural areas. In these areas, they need to take their foot off the accelerator. Digital banking, mobile banking and post office banking are not viable alternatives that work for all. There is still a need for bank branches on our local high street. And to me it is clear that this report 
states that not enough thought has been put into the decision to close branches. And I call now on RBS to review how it serves rural communities across the Highlands and across Scotland, because what I, it is doing at the moment does not serve those communities that it's meant to. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. I can say there's a little time in hand, so I can be a little elastic with the timings, not too elastic, just a little elastic, but not so that it snaps. Um, I, call, I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Ms. Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. I want to thank the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for bringing this debate on the report to the Chamber. This inquiry was held while I was a member of that committee, membership that I enjoyed immensely for two years. Before I talk about the report into banking closures, if I can be indulged, President Officer, I want to put on record my thanks to the convener, Gordon Lindhurst, Deputy Convener, John Mason, all the other committee members, and the hard-working team of committee clerks led by Ali Walker. During the inquiry into the closures of the last bank in town, I went with the committee clerks to Mintlaw, which saw its only bank closed in 2017. There we met with business owners and were able to get a feeling for the disadvantage that they felt. As the report heard time and time again in evidence, the banking of cash was a major issue, particularly around taking a long time out of the business day to bank cash in other towns, time they couldn't really spare. Post office provision still exists in Minlaw, but again, many other business owners from across Scotland who gave evidence this says there were two major issues with that. One was lack of confidentiality and a feeling of lack of security, particularly when carrying large amounts of cash. And then, as has been mentioned, the fact that they were limited in the amount of cash that they could bank at any one time. In, in Mint Law, it was only due to intervention from myself as the local MSP and my colleague, Councillor Jim Ingram, that a cash machine was installed, or else Mint Law would have had absolutely no access to cash at all. At our outreach meeting, we heard from a farmer who may, also made a very good point about the continued use of checks at local marts. He said he would get a cheque for selling his livestock and could be paying a cheque worth thousands of pounds in each time. I had similar conversations with constituents, constituents in Turriff, constituents who've just lost their Royal Bank, constituents who ran charities and community groups who got their subscriptions or donations in cash and cheques still and would struggle to get to a bank miles away from them. And it should be remembered that a lot of these groups are staffed by volunteers who also work during the day. So not having a bank branch on their doorstep is really problematic. Other members, I'm sure, will mention the social inclusion aspect of bank branch closures on the elderly and those in low incomes in particular. You can't internet bank if you don't own a computer. And many elderly and disabled people find accessing mobile vans difficult, as we've heard. Mintlaw was fortunate that the premises the Clydesdale Bank vacated didn't stay empty for long. But this seems to be a rather unusual situation. During evidence on the impact of empty bank buildings on a high street was one of the most compelling pieces of evidence. Buildings could fall into disrepair. The removal of the bank would impact on the footfall of neighbouring shops. And little or no effort was made by the banks to offer their buildings to community groups or business startups um, if they'd been standing empty with no real prospect for sale in the future. And it was interesting to hear Keith Brown mention a particular incident of that. We um, were struck by the evidence we heard on what consultation banks did or did not do with customers and how they communicated subsequent closure decisions to customers. In particular, I was confused at the value of having an access to banking standard that didn't, one, compel banks to consult with their cu customers ahead of making decisions on closures, and two, was supervised by the Lending Standards Board, which is made up of the banks themselves, effectively self-policing or in most cases, not policing at all. And although the standard asked banks to communicate on closures with customers, this often wasn't being followed. In Mint Law, customers complained that they get told about the closure of their uh, bank either very close to the closure date, or in some cases, they weren't told at all. Certainly, none of the customers we spoke to in all the evidence gathering were consulted beforehand on what uh, they used the bank for and what impact its closure might have on their business or their community. Many of our witnesses mentioned that contrary to the standard, they were only made aware of alternative banking methods after a branch, branch was closed, and I think that's simply unacceptable. Um, the, the Federation of Small Businesses colourfully described the banking standard as a paper tiger, and in the evidence I heard, I have to agree with them. 
So the committee were keen to go where the Scottish Affairs Committee in Westminster did not go when they put in the recommendation in the report that the access to banking standard has to be looked at again with a clear view on becoming much more customer focused. Um, one of our key recommendations was to rewrite the standard to include a, include a consultation with all customers, businesses and the local community when assessing whether a branch should be closed. We also asked questions on how a bank's assessment on footfall was carried out. In counting footfall, some banks would only count transactions made by their own branch customers. Now, I nip into Santander fairly regularly, but I can't remember the last time that I visited my own branch, which is near my old work in George Street in Aberdeen. And it's not exactly handy for me anymore, but I still go into a branch. But by these rules, I wouldn't be counted as using a branch. And they also said that they might only look at regular use. Well, quite what the definition of regular is, depending on the bank's own thoughts, and I'd suggest motivations. Uh, the economy's inquiry probably made very uncomfortable viewing for the banks. But with bank closures continuing apace, particularly as we mentioned so many times already today in rural communities, I believe we made some very important recommendations and found some pretty compelling evidence that I hope gives them pause for thought, but most importantly, gives rise to customers being at the centre of closure decisions. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Presiding officer, I welcome this debate and uh, I want to offer my thanks uh, to colleagues across the parliament who actually helped produce this uh, informative report. Committee reports and uh, committee work sometimes doesn't always uh, obtain the coverage uh, that it deserves, uh, but uh, I, I think that this report actually has been uh, well, uh, well received and it's certainly something that uh, I, uh, I thought was certainly something of a, a report that actually had a, a lot of information on it, but also something of use to that wider debate in terms of banking in the high streets today. Presenting also paragraph uh, 53, page 8, sets out the, the changing nature uh, of banking, and it's fair to say that the traditional banking activities uh, will not suit everyone. Online banking is increasing, uh, and this will not decrease in the years ahead. And presenting also, I want to focus my comments now actually just on my own constituency, I mean, like others. Uh, already have spoken, and no doubt uh, others after me. Uh, they're going to touch upon issues regarding their own constituents, and I'm, I'm going to do the same. Greenock and Inverclyde has lost banks in Port Glasgow, Gourock, and also Greenock, and in recent years, the Royal Bank of Scotland, um, they closed a branch in West Park Hall Street and moved the services uh, to its Cathcart Street branch, just, as, uh, just at the other end of the town centre. Now, I am a, an RBS customer, and I have been for many, many years. This decision, Although actually disappointing, it wasn't really campaigned against because customers uh, could actually see the, uh, the logic because they weren't losing a bank from the town centre uh, and the, the, the Cathcart Street branch was been there for many, many years. So it wasn't actually a, a huge uh, change or huge detriment to the town centre. So there wasn't a big campaign against it. Uh, and uh, it was certainly something that um, I, I didn't receive anybody uh, nobody contacted me to complain about that particular decision. But this summer, I was informed that the RBS, uh, they now want to close that Cathcart Street branch uh, and, uh, and move the facilities to the mortgage centre, which is uh, less than one mile away. Now, one mile uh, in a town centre uh, it may not seem like a lot. Certainly one mile in a, in a rural area uh, might be a bit different. And obviously colleagues have touched upon having to go to a bank maybe 20 miles or so away. But uh, I genuinely disagree with this decision that the RBS have put forward. I disagree with it for a variety of reasons. First of all, moving the bank out of the town centre uh, to the, basically the outskirts of the town, in between uh, two, uh, two stations, uh, it's going to take away people actually having uh, the chance to actually go off a train and go, to the, uh, and go down to the bank, which is literally 100 metres away. Secondly, although the distance isn't really that far away, its location means that customers who actually do go to it well, they actually need to plan their visit in addition to doing any of their other activities. By this, I mean that at the moment, with the Car Street branch in the town centre, folk can actually go into the bank. You can also go and spend money uh, in other parts of the town centre. I mean, there's a cafe just downstairs and there's also other shops just downstairs. So taking it out of the town centre takes away that economic opportunity. And thirdly, I do not believe that consultation has been done. But when I, um, in conjunction with the other uh, politicians, which I'll touch upon in a moment, we contacted the RBS 
uh, and, uh, and asked them a number of questions uh, and raised issues. And one of the things that they said back uh, to me was actually about they consulted. Now, as a customer, I wasn't consulted, but the level of consultation was, apparently they had somebody uh, in the Cathcart Street branch, and when folk came in, they just asked them a couple of questions. Now, I don't think that's consultation. I don't think that's good enough when it comes to actually removing that particular facility from the town centre. I mentioned a moment ago that, uh, that a few was wrote, and a joint letter was sent by Mike Russell, MSP, Brendan O'Hara, MP, Ronnie Cowan, MP, and myself, um, to the RBS exp expressing uh, our concerns and also anger at the decision. Indeed, certainly my colleagues who represent uh, Argyll and Butte, they raised their concerns because last December, uh, when they were informed that the, that the Rossi branch uh, was going to close, uh, their customers were told that actually they can go and use the Cathcart Street branch in Greenock Town Centre. Now, this takes the branch further away uh, from Rossi and, and its customers, and also makes it more challenging for those customers who actually rely upon the issue of public transport uh, to actually get to Greenock. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, Greenock Central Station uh, is just across the road from the Cathcart Street branch, whereas the mortgage centre is right in the middle between Greenock Central Station and Cathcart, uh, sorry, the Cart Stike Station. Now, except that the, uh, the Cathcart Street branch is not perfect and the, the costs uh, for the building uh, may well actually be expensive in future years. So uh, I genuinely wouldn't criticise the RBS for attempting to future-proof their business in terms of uh, customer, uh, certainly customer um, offer. But I believe this is a step too far. Now, colleagues from across the chamber have highlighted the, the wide variety of issues today, including the accessibility. And uh, the, the age uh, Scotland briefing highlights various points, including that 6 to 7% of people over 75 not using the internet. Now, with a constituency with an aging population, and over the course of the next five years, over the, the over 65 population will actually be increasing to 25%. Then this clearly uh, indicates that banks need to fully consider all their customers. Now, Dean Lockhart earlier uh, spoke about the uh, devolved and reserved matters uh, uh, and also suggested that the Scottish Government and UK Government should actually be working together. Now, I agree with them on this point, and I don't usually agree with Tories, but I agree with them on this point. But the UK Government must also use its influence. 70% of the stake in RBS is actually uh, it should, uh, should be utilised to help the communities and also our constituents. Now, paragraph 128, page 26 of the report asks the Scottish Government, local authorities and banks to work together. I agree, but also agree with Mike Rumbles, who is unfortunately not here at the moment, and I certainly won't make a habit of agreeing with Mike Rumbles. But uh, Mike Rumbles made the point, uh, he made the point that possibly too many of the recommendations have let the UK Government off the hook. And with that, I agree with him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for their report. Presiding Officer, from post office closures to bank branch closures, the demise of the town centre has greatly impacted upon everyone, all of us here in the chamber. The Royal Bank of Scotland's latest round of closures was amongst the worst for my constituents, towns and villages, left without a bank. Where the bank did once proudly sit on the high street, there is now a vacant and sightly property left behind. However, I'd like to say that uh, Ettrick Forest Interiors have moved into the bank in Selkirk, which is um, a welcome addition to the high street. So perhaps there is some opportunities for other businesses to move in. And I hope that Royal Bank of Scotland will work with local businesses to make that happen. The decision to close branches wasn't founded on solid and robust evidence. The Royal Bank of Scotland failed to carry out proper consultation before closing the branches, and I think this is an insult to customers, given their best interest is, interests clearly weren't taken into consideration from day one. Access to banking standard should require uh, banks to consult directly with customers as part of their impact study. Loyal customers who have banked with RBS for generations were left in the lurch with no option to move bank or face an arduous journey. Sorry, the only option was to move bank or face the ardu arduous journey to their nearest branch. And in a digital era where um, we can do online banking uh, with convenience, um, if you can and if you know how, with the ease of a mobile phone, um, the, the local branch might become redundant, but for many it remains an absolute necessity because of the lack of digital skills that some people have. 
Presiding officer, there is an assumption made by RBS that the post office would automatically pick up the slack for their departure from the high street. It was expected that they would deliver the services that RBS once did. And the fact remains, the post office is simply not an alternative for a bank branch. It offers a simple cash deposit and withdrawal service and has now become the place that businesses, local businesses on the high street are having to rely on. RBS failed to realise that the post office cannot provide the full range of services as RBS did. And what is most worrying, can I finish this sentence? Is worrying that the, the bank have actually taken a gamble in assuming that the post office will deal with the aftermath of the bank closures. I'll take an intervention. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for, for uh, giving way. I take the point she makes that uh, the post office cannot provide all the services, but I don't know what her experience was, but when we went out to Leaven, the people showed us a letter from the Royal Bank and it didn't even mention that any services were available in the post office. I wonder if her experience is, is any different, if the Royal Bank has encouraged people, as far as she knows, to actually use the post office. Rachel Hamilton. I thank John Mason for that intervention and uh, I had a similar, similar experience within my own, own constituency. There was no direct uh, link between uh, businesses being uh, given that advice. Um, they just presumed that that's what they would have to do. And um, in some instances, uh, there was uncertainty with regard to the uh, sustainability of the postmaster in the town itself. So therefore, um, the Royal Bank of Scotland presuming that the post office were going to be the alternative service clearly wasn't the case because they hadn't done their due diligence with the postmaster and the service that they were providing. But in many rural and remote villages in my constituency, there simply, as I've just said, isn't the luxury of the post office to fall back on for banking when the, the last bank leaves town. Simply put, it is unacceptable for RBS to assume that the post office will always be there in the case of a bank closure. And um, more and more we learn that even plan B options of ATMs and mobile banking um, vans aren't providing the reliable services that customers expect. Uh, there are parts of um, the area that I represent, such as Liddesdale, for example, that are almost an hour round trip to the nearest branch of RBS as a direct result of the closures. I'm glad the committee report acknowledges that uh, RBS promised that they would not shut the last bank branch in the town, but that was completely ignored. And what RBS have failed to recognise is that many people who live in these remote and rural areas are older and more vulnerable, and they now face these long journeys to their nearest branch, which is just unacceptable. The committee found that 67% of people over the age of 75 in Scotland do not use the internet. It's really disgraceful that elderly constituents, often without access to a car or a bus service, are just left with very little in the way of options other than the mobile banking vans. On that note, the mobile banking uh, routes could help alleviate some of the issues. However, the services they offer are often unreliable and irregular. And many constituents have complained, again, in, in places like Hoyk, of standing in a queue waiting for the service, and then the so the, the tellers tell them that they actually have to move on quickly to the next stop um, so they haven't got time to actually deal with the inquiry. Um, so it's not working as perfectly as I think RBS have expected. Um, I also want to give an example of in Eyemouth, I met a gentleman uh, who is a wheelchair user and he went to the mobile bank and he went to do just a simple transaction. The teller came out, on, out of the bank um, onto the street, which was on a pavement, which was totally unsuitable. The weather was um, blowing a gale, as it sometimes does on the coast in Eyemouth, and it just really wasn't suitable um, either for hearing for that gentleman or possibly the dignity and uh, respectful transaction that should be going on uh, inside uh, and in comfort. I have to say that after all my uh, rant about the RBS, community bankers actually have been rather helpful and they are working with communities in libraries and uh, leisure centres and carrying out home visits um, and also to help grasp um, digital skills. I don't know how much time I've got. You did say there was a bit more time, presiding officer. I've got a little few more points. Yes, and you also took an intervention. Okay, so thank proceed. you, presiding officer. Um, I just want to touch on the ATMs, which many people today have talked about. And we're learning um, from new figures from Link just last week that 
and they are the largest uh, cash machine network in the UK, that 250 ATMs are vanishing each month. And Age Scotland um, have, have noted that the loss of uh, free-to-use ATMs will result in a, a older people having to make withdrawals and being charged up to 30% um, from fee-paying machines. And <coughs> I, I welcome the recommendation in the committee's report which calls for ATMs to have their provision independently overseen and that any revised statutory arrangements are put in place following the revision of the access to banking standard. To conclude, rural Scotland has really taken a massive blow with these closures and we've heard so many contributions today that um, echo what I'm saying too. I'm glad that the um, Economy Committee have concluded this in their report and it is right and proper that RBS are held to account and that more can be done in the future to avoid this happening. Um, it causes significant stress and inconvenience uh, to many of our constituents and loyal customers have been disregarded, towns left without a bank and now ATMs being removed. It's time a proper study was carried out to highlight where our RBS can highlight the, uh, help these communities and to mitigate against further closures. Thank you. Thank you. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Colin Smith. Ms McAlpine, thank please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank all members of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for producing such a comprehensive and timely report on a subject of great concern to my constituents across south of Scotland region. Uh, I particularly welcome the committee's call for RBS branch closures to be put on hold or cancelled so that a proper study can look at the impact and scale of closures across Scotland. Although for many in my constituency, it's too little uh, and too late because the banks have already closed. Earlier this year, RBS, a bank as others have said, owned 60% by taxpayers, announced plans to close 16 branches across south of Scotland. And this came on top of extensive closures previously announced by RBS and the Bank of Scotland. And these aren't just closures in villages. They lost their banks a good few years ago. These are closures uh, in large market towns, uh, serving large rural areas um, and supporting villages, hamlets and, and farms. Uh, and of course, the branch closures are being compound, compounded, by, as others have said, the loss of ATMs uh, on our high streets. Um, and I just wanted to reflect that earlier Jackie Bailey talked about her loyalty uh, to banks. I too am an RBS customer and have been since I was a student, which was a long time ago. But I've been struck by the complete contempt that RBS show to their uh, customers uh, right across my constituency. And I have to say to myself as well as, a, as an MSP, I, like many other members, contacted the chief executive of RBS Ross McEwen, raising the concerns of my constituents and explaining the impact this decision would have uh, on many rural communities. Uh, my letter was responded to by Corporate Affairs at RBS, uh, who offered an interview with someone much further down the chain of decision makers than Mr McEwen. Mr McEwen is clearly a very busy man. Um, but then I did get, a, get, did get an email from Mr McEwen. Uh, unfortunately, he completely ignored uh, my letter on behalf of elderly and vulnerable constituents and small businesses and Langham, Annan and Lockerbie. No, he completely ignored that. Instead, he was writing to me to tell me about RBS's profits for the first half of this year. Um, apparently, they did very well. Uh, they made £1.8 billion and they made that money despite a fine from the US Department of Justice, he told me, uh, of £1 billion. It seems that it's easier for the American government to hold RBS to account than our own. Mr McEwen was also very keen to tell me that as a result of uh, these healthy profits, they'd made a very good start to the year, and he was pleased to announce his intention to declare a dividend of two pence per share, which he said was another significant moment in RBS's turn of, turnaround and the reflection of their progress. Not a single word, presiding officer, in that email about the customers, the loyal customers who have been deserted by RBS and Mr McEwen. That, to me, is not progress. Uh, communities that I raised with them, Langham, Lockerbie and Annan, uh, are important se centres of population and economic activity, which now do not have uh, RBS branch. Um, and just to illustrate um, uh, the the, the town of Langham, for example, is 30 miles from the nearest branch now, RBS uh, in Dumfries. 
In March this year, I heard a day of action outside every branch that was threatened with closure, and we collected hundreds of local signatures. And some people we spoke to had been loyal to the bank for more than 50 years and felt completely let down. Many were elderly. Uh, some did not or could not drive. They had no access to broadband, and which is, although it is improving, that doesn't mean to say everyone's going to take it up. Many older people don't have computers. They're not going to turn into silver surfers overnight and, and why should they presiding officer um, older people also expressed a preference for face-to-face -face branch banking uh, because of problems with phone banking and a lack of trust in digital which as someone who's a victim of the latest ba hacking and had my bank card completely compromised i have quite a lot of sympathy for um, I also want to congratulate the committee on the scrutiny that they applied to the matter of consultation, which other members have raised, or perhaps lack of consultation is more appropriate because that is, seems to be the case when a branch is targeted for closure. Uh, the report questions how the banks can know what customers want without consulting them and speaking to branch staff and assessing transaction numbers does not tell the whole story. Uh, this mirrors uh, my constituents experience. For example, in Langham, RBS had insisted that only 20 customers are using a branch, uh, the branch on a regular basis. But local people told me that that wasn't true, that there are always queues in the branch. Uh, Edge UK points out that a lot of the numbers that are used by banks uh, are, are very, very unreasonable. For example, a regular customer is considered to be someone who makes 24 visits to a branch in 20, 26 weeks, which is almost one visit a week. And that threshold, Edge UK points out, is unreasonably high. Uh, so I'm pleased that the committee concluded that the access to banking standard was failing to ensure that impact assessments properly reflect and take account of all relevant uh, impacts in the local economy. I was pleased to see that the committee said that the standard reflected the interests of banks, not the interests of customers, and that banks should be required to consult customers, businesses, and the local community in a meaningful way before deciding to close the branch. I know that the Scottish Government agrees with this particular finding of the committee, Access, the access to banking standard is perceived and presented as a consultation when it is absolutely nothing of the kind. It's whatever the banks want, to, want it to be and that certainly reflects the contempt that I referred to earlier with which this, these banks and RBS in particular hold their customers. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Alistair Allen. Mr Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer, and can I also thank the, the members of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for their report, which highlights a number of the negative impacts bank closures are having on each and every one of the communities we represent. As we heard earlier, from 2010 to 2017, the number of bank branches in Scotland fell by a third, and that decline is continuing. There are 130 so-called cash deserts in Scotland, not just without a bank within a reasonable distance, but without access to a cash machine. Jackie Bailey very kindly told the story of when I was, found myself struggling to pay in a cafe recently because it had no card payment machine, uh, no ATM nearby, and no bank branch. So I was bailed out by a, a colleague. I'd like to tell a, a similar story about Jackie Bailey, but I can't remember the last time she bought me a drink. But, oh, oh, but, outrageous. But on a, on a serious note, the, the, the impact of bank and ATM closures uh, is often felt most acutely in, in, in rural areas, such as the one I found myself in recently, where alternatives are, are few and far between, as well as in some of our most deprived communities, a point which I think was highlighted to the committee well by, by Keith Driver of Citizen Advice Scotland when he said, the most vulnerable to change are the ones who will be affected, those who are more likely to have problems accessing digital services, those who have poor broadband speeds, and those in rural Scotland. The cumulative effect of, of closure after closure is leaving more and more of our towns and villages without a single bank branch. Let me give members just one of several examples I could choose in my own home region of Dumfries and Galloway. The town of Dalbiti has a population of over 4,000 people. A decade ago, the town was served by three banks. The first to be axed was the Clydesdale Bank in 2007. This was followed by the Royal Bank of Scotland in 2014. And last year, the Bank of Scotland closed its doors for the last time in the town, leaving Dalbiti with no bank. And it's not alone from, from Whithorn in the west of the region to Lochmaber in the east. 
the local bank branch has become a distant memory. We're told by banks that alternatives are in place, such as mobile banking, but in the case of Dalbiti, which I've highlighted, that consists of one bank a couple of hours per week. We're also told that the post office is an alternative, and certainly for simple bank trans transactions, that can be true. But for many towns and villages, that option no longer exists, with post office closures continuing in many communities. It also seems that the UK government are doing their best to discourage the use of the post office, with the Department of Work and Pensions writing to those in receipt of a pension last month, telling them they no longer wish to pay that pension into a post office card account. And although carrying out banking transactions can be labour intensive and time consuming for post offices, the amounts paid for these transactions is often very poor. For example, bank charge business customers, banks charge business customers between £6 and £10 per £1,000 deposited, but only a tiny proportion of these charges filter down to the post office owner who has paid either 24p or 37p per £1,000 deposited. That can be less than a tenner to transact £40,000, hardly an incentive for a post office to remain open to deliver services on behalf of banks. So, presiding officer, Online banking often can be the only alternative left for communities, and yes, that is the choice of more and more people. But as Age Scotland highlights, 67 per cent of people over the age of 75 in Scotland do not use the internet. The Federation of Small Businesses stated in their evidence to the committee that many bank closures have been in areas with lower than average broadband speeds, and which noted that poor broadband is identified as a key reason for people's decision not to use online banking services pointing out that online banking is particularly inaccessible to those who are most financially excluded. Presiding officer, beyond the adverse impact on individual customers, the committee's report rightly highlights the problems branch closures have posed for many charities and small businesses. The committee found that, that cash is essential for some businesses, and the report states that bank branch closures have impacted on productivity, which will impact on Scotland's economy. The risk posed to small businesses by these closures have been highlighted in the past by the Federation of Small Business, who research found that often created additional costs to business owners, and they highlighted the importance of local branch branch branches in terms of cash flow and the value of face-to-face -face interactions. Research by the British Bankers Association also found that 68% of business customers believe that access to a local branch is important. And beyond the direct impact on businesses, the closure of banks and the resulting reduced footfall undermines our town centres, already plagued by empty buildings as more and more retailers close their doors. The problems posed by these closures are undoubtedly heightened, not just by poor digital connectivity, but inadequate physical connectivity. The committee's report notes research by the Citizens Advice Bureau which found that people living in rural areas typically had to make a 40-minute round trip to their bank using buses if they're lucky to still have a bus service. And this is before the most recent set of closures has come into force. Indeed, Keith Dreiber said to the committee that he expects travel time will increase significantly as branch closures continue. President officer, there's widespread agreement that the current decimation of local bank branches cannot be allowed to continue unchallenged. And that means we need both the Scottish and UK governments to intervene. So I echo the committee's call for the Scottish government to call a summit with high street banks in Scotland to discuss these issues and possible solutions, including shared banking hubs. I raised the possibility of banking hubs in a recent letter to the chief executive of the Royal Bank of Scotland, like Joe McAlpine, didn't get a reply from him, but one of his members of staff who dismissed it as not a sustainable solution. The truth is, it's not a case of not being able to do it. It's a case of our bank simply not wanting a more collaborative, community-focused approach to banking. And, presiding officer, that's just not good enough. Where is the concern for community from our banks? Why have they learned nothing about social responsibility since their financial vandalism caused the economic tsunami a decade ago? So, in the absence of voluntary action from our banks, we need direct intervention. The committee rightly highlights the serious shortcomings of the access to banking standard, stating that it's failing to ensure that impact assessments properly reflect and take account of all relevant impacts on the local economy. That's why we need a mandatory consultation on bank branch closures before, not after they close. If banks won't do that properly, then we need legislation from the UK government to ensure they do, and that's what a future Labour government will deliver. 
The Scottish Government can also do more, for example, redoubling efforts to grow credit unions in our communities to make them a viable alternative and delivering far more support for regenerating our increasingly neglected town centres to increase footfall. President officer, unless action is taken, it is only a matter of time before local bank branches disappear for good, out with only our very largest towns and cities, and that cannot be allowed to happen. Thank you. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Allen, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank the committee for bringing such a comprehensive and helpful report to Parliament and for facilitating this debate today. As members will be aware, the decline in the number of ATMs and the decline in the number of bank branches cannot easily be separated. So I'd like to take the opportunity to speak about how both of these issues affect rural areas such as my own. Now, as the committee report acknowledges, the decline in the number of ATMs has accelerated in recent years. To some extent, this can be attributed, as other members have noted, to the decline in the use of cash. Indeed, there are some countries such as Denmark and Norway which have already floated the idea of ceasing to circulate banknotes and coins altogether. However, as other members too have noted, I, I think it's fair to suggest uh, that Scotland is a long way from that situation. And for as long as that is true, we will need ATMs. The committee evidently takes that view too. Now, perhaps not for the first time, my constituency is able to provide an extreme example to illustrate a wider point. 1,200 people live on the Isle of Barra. They have one bank, the Royal Bank of Scotland, with one ATM. There is, as things stand, no other way for customers to withdraw cash outside working hours. Yet last December, RBS announced plans to close both the branch and its ATM, reassuring customers that there was another branch they could go to some 27 miles away in Loch Boysdale. What they failed to mention was that Loch Boysdale is on another island, South Uist, and that in any case, RBS are cutting the hours the branch opens there too. So my constituents in Barra would face spending most of a day, if they picked the right day, by ferry and bus, just to get to the nearest bank or ATM and back. Now, while the picture has changed several times regarding the ATM, it does now look like uh, Barra's ATM has been reprieved after much protest, but not so the bank branch itself. Already some 12,000 people, that is to say 10 times the population of Barra, have signed a petition demanding RBS reverse the decision about branch closure, recognizing that this is indeed perhaps the most extreme example of RBS's callousness towards its rural customers. The Barra branch was one of 10 proposed closures across, across Scotland that were eventually postponed until later this year, subject to a review by the firm Johnson Carmichael. But all of that said, it cannot have escaped the notice of any community in Scotland facing such closures that the cost to the UK taxpayer of bailing out RBS was some £45.5 billion. Last week, RBS chairman Sir Howard Davis admitted that it was unlikely that the UK government would ever uh, be able to recoup this money. And it seems that despite all of that, RBS don't see themselves as having any responsibility to provide much of a service to these taxpayers. Conservative members may wish to use some of their famed influence with the UK government to remind them that they own some 62% of RBS shares. RBS is still effectively owned by the Conservative government. And it is difficult to square this situation with the reality outlined in the Federation of Small Businesses written evidence to the committee that RBS alone will within the next few weeks have closed some 70% of its branches around Scotland since 2013. The Federation of Small Businesses rightly point to the impact which this will have on cash dependent small businesses around the country. And the FSB also gave evidence indicating their fears that if the payment which Link, requires to card, which Link requires card providers to pay to cash machine operators declines, then there will be even greater pressure to withdraw further free ATMs in the future. With regards to Barra, uh, I have already submitted a response to RBS's consultation on behalf of the constituents who have contacted me on this issue. Unsurprisingly, nobody has come to me making a case for the closure to go ahead given the alternatives, or rather the lack of them. 
Instead, I have heard consistently about how personal and business customers will be disadvantaged if they are left without any branch to go to at all. Many people have also mentioned the impact which a closure would have for the many tourists visiting the island, and I am sure this is true for other parts of Scotland too. Presiding officer, the committee has provided a report which does not pull its punches on these questions, concluding that it is the most vulnerable people who will be affected most by these closures. The committee says RBS previously said that it would not shut the last branch in town. Clearly, that was a hollow promise. Presiding officer, nowhere was that promise more obviously hollow than in the Isle of Barra. And so I call on the Royal Bank of Scotland to step in to save that branch and other branches elsewhere, which will be so much missed by the communities round about them. And I ask them to do so um, in their own interest to try to repair the confidence of the community in the banking service and in them. Thank you very much. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and uh, I welcome the opportunity uh, to speak in today's debate and thank the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for bringing it to the Chamber. It is one that's being considered both here and in Westminster and affects so many of our constituencies, as we've heard so much of today. And the only area, that, uh, the area in which I represent, uh, uh, we have had recent closures in Girvan, Cumnock and Mochlin, and if you uh, happen to be uh, a, a resident of Girvan, that means you have to have a round trip either to Ayr or to Stranraer uh, to do your banking, which is, is, which is a, a significant uh, journey if you have a car. But if you have to use public transport, it becomes extremely problematic. And I have to say that uh, much like uh, Alistair Allen's experience in Barra, um, uh, the ATM in Maybole was under threatened, and was threatened with closure but uh, that, that, that we managed to get that decision reversed. So it is possible to have small uh, victories uh, as we go forward. Deputy Presiding Officer, death, taxes and change. The three inevitabilities in life, uh, interestingly enough, all three things that we tend not to be too keen on. Um, change is something that we are nearly always uh, wary of. However, with most things in life, the way we do business continues to evolve. With banks, we know that there have been some 42% decline in bank usage in Scotland since 2014. More and more customers are banking online via an app on their phones, negating the need for many over-the-counter services. With this backdrop, uh, uh, change is inevitable. We expect our banks to be commercial, yet we also ask that they deliver a public services. And I think sometimes those two things get in the way of each other. As I said, I think change is inevitable. But have, they, have the bank got these changes right? Obvious from today's debate, and I would also suggest they have a lot of work to do uh, to deliver that. And in delivering change, it's important that we don't leave any section of our society behind. I think this, is, this to me, is where this debate has been focused. But uh, some of the solutions are already out there. There has been mobile banking uh, for some 70 years or more, so it's not a new concept. But the issues I've encountered with, uh, with mobile banking in the rural areas I represent have been around timings and routes and access. But the thing is, we can actually get those changed. I didn't realize until recently that mobile banking can actually come to your home if needs be. Now, how many of the customers actually know this, especially those with specific needs, such as those who are frail and those with disabilities that make attending a normal bank or mobile bank difficult? And I think we as MSPs and, and MPs as well uh, can help to get that message out there. There are tech, tech experts out there, there are business growth enablers, relationship managers and community bankers who, if asked, are perfectly prepared to deliver guidance on online banking. I have to say I got a, a tech expert to deliver a session at Age Concern meeting in Girvan. Does this solve everybody's issue? Of course it doesn't. But it goes some way to maybe to help some. And I think this is, this is a, an area which while, while we, uh, while we are, are holding the banks to account, we as MSPs perhaps uh, can do a little bit more. So we are, we are quite rightly arguing the case for our constituents and, and, and opposing closures. I think we also have that responsibility to help deliver solutions and ensure that those solutions reach those who need them. If we take the post office banking, for example, we know that the majority of personal transactions are cash transactions. 
which are suitable for, for the post office model mm -hmm. if the right training and delivery mechanism uh, and, and services adhere to. And there's without doubt there's a, certainly a disparity in the deliver of that, delivery of that service, which again needs to be addressed. Where there's a definite need to push back is in the decline of ATMs. We need access to cash and there has been a worrying decline in the number of free cash machines available and it's been mentioned already today. There's 1,300 in the UK in a year have been dropped. 76 of those were in supposed protected areas. Now that cannot be allowed to continue. Link committed to maintaining the geographical spread of ATMs so that rural communities did not lose access to the cash. And as we've heard today, this is contrary to what is happening on the ground and they actually need to be held to account uh, on their commitment. So it's clear that the future of banking is changing. Uh, the responsibility that both banks and government share is to make sure that change comes in a way and at a pace that leaves no one behind. And I think as MSPs, we have a, a, an ability to impact this. As it stands, too many of the most vulnerable in society are falling through the cracks as banks rush to make closures uh, and perhaps don't put as much time and money into supporting customers for whom a branch isn't just a convenience, it's a necessity. And attending one of the committee's fact-finding meetings in Domellington, which is one of the affected towns in the area I represent, it was obvious there is real concern that communities are being left behind and disadvantaged in what, as we say, is a public service. Should we expect the banks to continue delivering the same service in the same way in perpetuity, especially in the face of the speed of technological change? That would be ridiculous. However, have the banks delivered change without disadvantaging sections of the community? Again, today's debate has highlighted that they have fallen well short in this regard. But I think rather than continually just railing against banks uh, uh, all these changes, I think it's important that we ensure that solutions are delivered to those who need. There are closures that absolutely should be resisted. And where closures are, closures are reluctant, reluctantly needed, we must ensure that no one is left behind we need to hold the banks to account and ensure that they deliver real solutions and, and ra rather than uh, and, and ensure that we help to disseminate that information that no one is disadvantaged. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Fulton McGregor, followed by Colin Beatty. Mr Beatty will the last speaker in the open debate, so you've got your warning. Not not to you, Mr. McGregor. You're not warned. Well, thank you very I call much. Mr. McGregor. Well, thank you very much, President Austin. I'm grateful for that. I'm also grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate as now a former member of the committee. And I'd like to thank the clerks and the members for all their work during my short time on this committee. The Royal Bank of Scotland branch in Steps, in my constituency, was one of the 62 closed and very much fell within the last, branch, but last bank in town stays. But it was also the last bank for neighbouring villages, the only bank available for a couple of miles for people living in Chryson, Muirhead, Moody's Burn and Oak and Walk. I'm pleased that there was no decision to close the Cote Bridge branch, but my constituents in the nor Northern Corridor area of my constituency now face having to travel not only out of their own villages or out of the boundaries of the constituency they live in, but out with the local authority area which they live. Kirkintillic is now the closest branch for most of the people living in the north part of my constituency, and thousands are affected. And I'm sorry to say, but it is just another example of this Tory government attacking old industrial communities, perhaps made more relevant in the week we remember the 59th anniversary of the Auchin Geek mining disaster and the aforementioned Moody's Burn. But it's right, President Officer, that we focus on the real impact on real people. The closures of these banks has a massive impact on business, both high street and mobile. Self-employed business people who take in cash now have to travel even further to, to bank their takings. During the committee sessions, it was suggested that as much as 80% of retail transactions are conducted with cash. What is the solution for these business owners? For personal bank users, many people of my generation will rarely set foot inside a branch, and that is the justifi justification given by I RBS when making these decisions. But we shouldn't be focus focusing on the people who don't use branches. Many older people still do most of their banking in a branch. What about the lady from Christon, who's a 100th birthday party I attended the other day, and at many, many other elderly residents in this part of the country? And let's not forget that it is older, more vulnerable people that fraud fraudsters routinely target. It was only on Saturday past there that Monkman's police issued a serious warning that fraudsters were contacting mainly elderly folk across the area uh, trying to scam them. Removing the ability of someone to get into a branch and speak to someone at the counter may give opportunity for these people to succeed. 
As has been mentioned already by various speakers, the Royal Bank of Scotland is majority owned by the state. It was taxpayers' money that bailed out the bank when it failed, faced collapse, and now the state does nothing but stand by and watch as they close branches all over Scotland and the rest of the UK. Commitments were always given by RBS that they would never remove the last bank in town. Commitments that were completely disregarded as part of the latest round of closures and, of course, the cash machines that went with it, leaving only one cash machine in steps. And I noticed the other day that it was out of order. Um, so, uh, so for a period of time, no cash machine in that area either. However, a step I do welcome is RBS putting in place a community banker to help fill gaps and meet needs. And I have to say, President Norset, I have been very impressed with this service. The community banker for steps and surrounding areas, Lindsay Haggerty, has reached out to me and others and has been extremely flexible and responsive to suggestions and the needs of the community. For example, she has been open to having surgeries in areas where there is an unmet need. But I do feel that, there, that had there been more full consultation, or any consultation as others have pointed out, this community banking service is something that could have been put to the communities at an earlier stage for scrutiny and consideration. And perhaps the banks would have found that if people had a say in it, it's something that they could have perhaps worked with. In addition to this, I have had various discussions with both the RBS and with the local community in steps about the impact of the closure. And I was pleased in response to my query that the bank suggested it would be open to gifting the new derelict building to the community for the good of the village. But again, as Keith Brown had mentioned earlier, only once other options had been exhausted. This is something that we talked about in the committee at great length, and it certainly is a positive step if banks would do that. But, President Officer, this is mainly a reserved matter. If this Tory government won't do its duty and use its majority shareholding to order the reversal of these closures, the very least that can be done is to make the building available to communities. And I say to the Tories in the Chamber today, what are you doing for your communities? Time after time, when the UK government fails to act in the interest of the people of Scotland, the Tory MPs and MSPs from Scottish constituencies and regions fail to act. They fail to stand up for their constituents. Each passing day gives us a clearer picture. Yes. Rachel Hamilton. I thank Fulton McGregor for taking in the intervention. Um, I'm not sure if Fulton McGregor uh, realised that, but in Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire, presiding officer, I held a series of public meetings uh, to engage with those people uh, who were facing closure of their banks. I felt that uh, as a constituency MSP, I had very much reached out. I wondered if um, the member had done the same. Mr. McGregor. Uh, as, as I've already said um, to the member, I have engaged with the community um, in steps about the closure of the bank, and I'm glad to hear that she's done likewise. I'd be interested to see what sort of response she got from her party colleagues in London to that intervention. But as I was saying, President Officer, as each day, passing day gives us a clearer picture, and has always been the case, the people of Scotland simply don't matter to the Conservative Party. And the to Tory parliamentarians elected in Scotland stand by and let their masters in London run roughshod over their towns and villages, despite what an individual MSP might do. President officer, throughout the time since the announcement was first made about these closures, Scottish Government ministers have made it clear their willingness to work with the UK counterparts to do what is right. This has been continually ignored by the UK Government, as tends to be the case these days in a number of issues. President officer, in finishing, I make a final plea on behalf of my constituents to the UK Government and to the party's representatives here today. Act and act now. Work with the Scottish Government to help the communities devastated by these closures and prevent any further. Thank you, President officer. Thank you, Ms McGregor. I now call Colin Beattie, then we'll move to closing speeches. Mr Beattie, please. Presiding officer, as a member of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate. Research by the Federation of Small Businesses shows that bank branches are closing at a faster rate in Scotland than in any other UK nation. As a result, no fewer than one in two businesses have experienced bank closures. Evidence taken by the committee suggests that there are indications to show that bank closures directly impact on the health of the local economy and on the establishment and growth of local businesses. Banks have not been particularly honest in their engagement on this subject. For example, RBS stated that they would never close the last bank in town. And yes, exa that's exactly what they've done. Figures quoted in 2016 suggest this has happened 165 times in Scotland and the north of England. In community communities such as Kilmalcolm, Gurick, Preston Pans, and more locally, Newton Grange, and also in Pathhead in my own constituency of Middle of the North and Musselburgh. Earlier this year, RBS closed their branch in Bonnyrigg in my constituency. 
the inconvenience to local businesses and to personal customers, many of whom are vulnerable and elderly, was considerable. Bank closures continue the pernicious hollowing out of our communities as libraries and other local facilities, which form the heart of these communities, are either closed or run down. It's increasingly important to retain bank branches, which are, which are so important to the health and wealth of our local communities. It's not just inconvenience, it's an attack on the sustainability of our smaller towns and villages. When the RBS announcement was made, I met with representatives from RBS to express my concern and disappointment that this decision to close the Bonnerig branch had been taken with so little real consultation. RBS took the view that more and more customers banking online and by phone, overall branch usage reducing by 44% since 2012, and around 29 million logons every month to the mobile app was the justification for such a large branch network being hard to support. In the Bonnerig branch, transactions had dropped by 20% since 2012, and 80% of customers were using alternative access to banking. RBS assured me that vulnerable customers were being contacted to explain their options. A fine story was told of how RBS were providing experts to train people to use online or other digital means of accessing their accounts. Business clients were also contacted to explain the most appropriate ways for their business support to continue. By the time RBS had described to me the wonderful support and services that would be available to their customers after the branch closure, I wonder why any branches at all were kept open, so perfect were the arrangements being put in place. Unfortunately, the reality is that service and support would be significantly reduced, especially after the initial period after closure. Customers were directed to the local post office, where long-term arrangements had been made to accommodate both business and personal customers. But a post office simply does not have the capacity or the will to replace a bank. They are, quite frankly, different businesses. A post office can handle basic transactions if they're low volume and within very tight parameters. Bonnerig is one of the largest towns in my constituency, containing a large number of small businesses whose turnover is mostly in cash. They need to be able to bank these takings, but without a local bank or adequate arrangements through the post office, the businessman either needs to take time out of his day to travel to the nearest bank branch or pay for the money to be uplifted. Now, I understand the pure logic of why as a business RBS decided to close this branch given reduced customer footfall and the rise of electronic banking. However, I took the opportunity to point out that banks need to look at a much wider picture than short-term profit enhancement. They also have a social responsibility to the local community and to the development of the environment in which we live and work. Banks should be part of this, and if they fail to be so, then alternative structures will gradually come into being, which will result in their exclusion and isolation from the communities in which they previously played such an important role. This cannot be to the bank's long-term viability. Banks must be relevant or they will cease to be part of our communities and may well be overtaken and vanish. RBS made much of arrangements with local post office to allow personal customers to withdraw and deposit cash, deposit checks, and allow business customers to register to obtain coinage and to deposit cash. And yet earlier this month, only a few months after RBS closed its doors, it was announced that Bonnerig Post Office would be closing at the end of this month. And while the post office is actively looking for another location within the town, progress is slow. I think that perhaps RBS, who's supposedly been putting alternative banking arrangements in place, have faced res residents with considerable inconvenience who will have to use branches located some distance away. And for the elderly or disabled, this will prove difficult. While there has been scrutiny of the impact bank closures have on businesses and the wider community, the impact closures have on the ATM network receives less attention. This is despite the fact that many ATMs in Scotland are located in or nearby bank branches and have been cited by banks as the replacement for lost branches. ATMs have the potential to offset some of the problems experienced by bank closures. Access to banking and financial inclusion are two basic requirements of any functioning economy and should be recognized by all who seek to sell products and services to small businesses. Typically, small business banking services involve managing cash flow, checking account balances, but they might also include more complicated issues such as applying for a business loan. Without a local branch to visit, to discuss options, businesses are left with very few options for guidance and advice. Finally, with services all across Scotland being cut, and towns such as Bonnerig losing out on vital services like banks and post offices, you have to ask yourself how people are supposed to go about their daily life without access to money. 
And while I recognise people have debit and credit cards or even access to contactless payments if it's under £30, many vulnerable people do not feel safe using these methods and prefer to have access to money in their purse or wallet. Local businesses rely on the support from bank branches and when a branch does close, the impact on these businesses could be vital to the future of the small businesses. Banks need to revisit their assumptions and engage with that bigger picture, while the Scottish Government must have a role in that engagement. Thank you. Uh, closing speeches. I can give all the closing speakers an extra minute. I know you'll have no difficulty fulfilling it. So call Lewis MacDonald, close for Labour. Seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Today's debate has reminded us once again of the gulf between what communities expect from their high street banks and what those banks actually think they are obliged to do. Banking is indeed, as has been said, a public service provided by private businesses. But of course, that does not tell the whole story. Rarely has any sector of private business owed its very survival to such a large scale of public intervention. And while closing local branches may represent a different scale of impact from the casino banking, which brought the global economy so close to catastrophe a decade ago. The sweeping closures we've seen in Scotland and across the UK in recent years suggest that bank executive, executives still pay scant regard to the communities which provide their profits and whose need for financial services they are supposed to meet. In my own region, we have seen round after round of closures, most recently, uh, but not exclusively, by the Royal Bank of Scotland. The list of, list of RBS closures reads like a travel guide to the northeast. Banff and Turriff and Huntley and Ellen and Montrose this year, West Hill and Bankery and Stonehaven last year, and as Mike Rumbles reminded us, Afford and other local branches before that. In Aberdeen City, suburban communities like Dice and Bridge of Dawn have also lost their local branch, and of course many local jobs have gone as a result. So I joined with members of the Bank Workers Union Unite earlier this year in a protest at the Bridge of Dawn RBS against that closure and against uh, the wider closure programme as a whole. Sadly though, as we have heard today, the best efforts of staff, trade unions, customers and parliamentary committees have so far failed to halt the industry's drive to withdraw from most of Scotland's high streets. Of course, it's true, as the banking industry are keen to tell us, that not everyone values a local branch. Many customers do choose to do their financial transactions online or uh, uh, through a mobile phone, and those choices are certainly beneficial from the point of view of the bank's bottom line. But the key word here is choices, and what branch closures do is to deny choice to those customers who prefer to bank in person in their local community. As we have heard this afternoon, the customers who are least interested in online or mobile banking and choose to use a local bank are often older people and more vulnerable people. 20% of people in Scotland today are not online at home, and it, those, it is those people who have the most to lose from the kind of closure programme we have seen. And it is often, as Age Scotland have strongly pointed out, it is often the very same people who are socially isolated in other ways <coughs> for whom doing business at their local bank or post office or shop is important, not just in itself, uh, but as part, part of what keeps them in touch with their local community uh, and gets them out of the house to have that social engagement, which is so vital uh, for their health and well-being. And we've also heard this afternoon a number of contributions about the importance of local bank facilities for local businesses. The ability to deposit takings and to access cash are vital to the day-to-day -day running of many small firms. Again, some small businesses are very comfortable, very happy uh, doing much of their work online, but many do not, many don't have that choice given the nature of their business. And again, what matters here is that businesses should have a choice about where to do their banking and be able to do what suits them best. Instead, we have a blanket approach by banks, and we've seen evidence in the committee's report, and we've heard again some reference to this today. Banks which want to speed up the shift from face-to-face -face banking to online transactions, as if they want to make online transactions the standard way or indeed the only way of accessing cash and services, rather than one of several options open to their customers. And too many rural areas particularly find themselves in the position where those choices have been taken away. So this debate is about access for individual customers, especially older and more vulnerable people. It is also about access for businesses, 
in particular local small firms which rely on cash transactions with local customers. It's also about the health and well-being of local communities themselves. There seems still to be little willingness on the bar, pa part of the banking industry to accept a collective responsibility for ensuring continued access to face-to-face -face banking for those who choose that in local communities. And that, I think, is what needs to change. Banks compete with each other, of course, as well as with alternative providers of financial services. So it might seem counterintuitive for them to cooperate to provide all their customers with choice about how they access banking service. But that actually is what needs to happen. And among several very good recommendations in this report, the one I would highlight <coughs> is the one which calls on the Scottish Government to call a summit to get banks to work together to provide access to shared services, for example, through a shared banking hub in a community. And I hope ministers will agree uh, to do that, of course. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way and his emphasis on the banks working together. I mean, doesn't he think uh, with me that the link system where the banks do work together and you can basically get your cash out of almost any machine shows that they can work together if it suits them? Lewis MacDonald. John Mason is absolutely right. The link system is a critical way in which banks combine to provide a service. There, of course, is a commercial ang uh, aspect to that, and we've heard that there has been uh, serious concern about that in the recent past. But the point about putting pressure on the link system in order to pro provide or maintain that access to cash machines is one that can certainly be replicated for banks and branches themselves. Why not have banks work together if a community, whether it's Castle Bay and Barra, whether it's Afford and Aberdeenshire, whatever it is, wh wh if, if a community can have access to the services of several different banks through a, a hub operated by one of them, that clearly is a better solution for everybody than to get a position where bank after bank after bank closes. And as Colin Smith said in his example, you go in a, matter, a very short time from having three bank branches in a village or, or town to having none at all. So I think that's an area where there is uh, uh, action that can be taken. We've heard also about strengthening the access standard, which we support, and about improving delivery of such of banking services by post offices, credit unions, and mobile banking vans, which would also be welcome in as far as that can be done. But ensuring that uh, engaging banks in the delivery of shared services is something which Scottish ministers can do without uh, waiting for uh, action elsewhere, and I hope that will now follow. Paul Wheelhouse reported to Parliament a year ago that there was a recognition among members of the Scottish Government's Financial Services Advisory Board that consideration of the impact of closures was now necessary. Uh, we now need to see banks act on that recognition. If they do not, the case for changing the law will only get stronger. If the only way to protect choice for customers is to put new legal obligations on banks in relation to public access in communities, then we believe that is what should happen. And as my colleagues have already said, a good start would be to require banks to consult local communities and businesses before a decision to close is made, not after. And that is a change which would be required by law and build on this committee's report. Thank you very much. I call on Jamie Halker Johnson to close for the Conservatives. Seven minutes, please, Mr. Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, briefly uh, apologise to the Minister and to my colleague Dean Lockhart for leaving the chamber briefly during their speech? Um, I would like to join previous speech, uh, speakers in expressing my gratitude to those, uh, my fellow members of the committee, uh, as well as the clerking team for all their support um, during the course of our inquiry. And I'd also like to thank the organisations that came to the Scottish Parliament to give evidence um, and those organisations and individuals that submitted uh, uh, written evidence to support the committee's work. Today's speeches have uh, told us much about the local impact of national decisions on bank closures. Often the communities most affected by, uh, affected by local branch closures are those in remote and rural areas, of which, of course, there are many in my region, the Highlands and Islands. And it was also significant that we've looked not just at the most recent round of bank closures, but the longer-term decline in branch numbers and other services as a backdrop for these changes. It's uh, it was important, however, that this inquiry provided a Scotland-wide picture addressing how different communities interact with banking services. And the social impact of closures, as well as the effects of financial exclusion amongst certain groups, was rightly a major consideration of the committee's work. While accessibility via online and telephone banking has for some made banking more accessible, it's equally true to say that the move away from face-to-face -face banking services has created barriers for others. We also explored the impact on business and the effect not only on the different sectors and businesses of different sizes, but also on businesses located in different geographical areas. With connectivity still a challenge in many parts of my region, 
many of the most obvious electronic solutions are untenable. Our conclusion relating to the needs of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the need for Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise, as well as the banks themselves, to work with these businesses is significant and one that I would underline. Equally, we've heard evidence from community and voluntary groups, such as the U3A Murray Coast uh, in my region, who spoke of the challenges for voluntary organisations of regularly changing signatories on accounts and other administrative tasks without easy access to a local branch. And as, inquiry, uh, as the inquiry progressed, we also had the opportunity to hear from a number of banks about the work they are undertaking to create modern banking services. Much of this is praiseworthy, from, from paying in checks electronically to cash uplift services, there clearly uh, has been a considerable amount done in recent years to improve access. It is, however, worth noting that, despite these approaches, a range of concerns were heard by the committee and are recognised in our report. It's clear that there is a trade-off here. With more accessible electronic banking, footfall in branches has clearly declined. There are a number of uh, areas for development beyond this report. We were candid, uh, candid in the need for additional information to build a comprehensive picture of the impact of closures across Scotland and across the UK more widely. And this should include, uh, this should include, uh, sorry, this should include what provision can be made for access and the role of Scotland's two governments in supporting solutions um, to the problems that we've heard. Equally, our remit did not include the, the perhaps difficult task of exploring the future of banking in this country. There are clearly a number of concerns that technological progress has, ra uh, has raised and we've yet to see serious discussion, for example, the wider uh, opportunities and problems created by an increasingly cashless society. Presiding officer, there have been a number of positive and insightful contributions from around the chamber today. Our convener and my parliamentary colleague, uh, Gordon Lintus, uh, speaking on behalf of the committee, summarised the findings of our inquiry well and set out a number of the recommendations we've made as future steps forward. I would hope that these recommendations were welcomed by the Minister and that there will be an opportunity to progress on them. Dean Lockhart discussed the, rel uh, the related issue of ATMs. The committee recognised that these devices, particularly free to use ATMs, are an important means of accessing cash in many, uh, any, many areas across Scotland uh, and many areas of my region of the Highlands and Islands. As a committee, we did recognise the current controversy around charging by the link network and heard some evidence of this area. Members will also f uh, be familiar that some million, uh, so, so, Simi uh, similar issues have been explored by the Scottish Affairs Select Committee at the UK Parliament through a dedicated ATM network inquiry earlier this year. We also considered the limitations of ATMs, which, as Link explained, were targeted at individuals rather than at businesses. Edward, uh, Edward Mountain rightly talked about the impact on our region, the Highlands and Islands, and highlighted that banks should, of course, have been consulting before closure, is something I think Stuart McMillan mentioned as well, and others. And the issues, of course, with accessibility for some of our disabled constituents. Rachel Hamilton also spoke about uh, the lack of cons uh, consultation and further on the issue of ATM closures, which, again, are particularly pertinent in places like the borders. She also spoke of access via the mobile, uh, mobile banking vans, which have become such a common feature of many rural communities and, of course, of their drawbacks. The post office's capacity to provide a full alternative uh, for face-to-face -face banking services was also mentioned, which is something that the, con the con uh, committee considered and heard a range uh, of views on. Brian Whittle spoke about the need to help those most affected by bank closures to access the new services available to which uh, might help mitigate some of the closures themselves. Looking at uh, other contributions, um, the Minister talked about the strength of feeling and the impact on rural communities, and as a Highland MSP, she'll know as well as uh, all, all of us that live in rural remote communities that, uh, how, how much that, that can affect. Uh, Jackie Bailey talked about her disappointment with her own bank, and I'm sure she echoes the opinions of hundreds of thousands of people, and many of us across Scotland, who have been left uh, with a bank further away than they started. We also learnt that uh, Colin Smith doesn't buy a round, and that was later confirmed by him. Well, you can, you, you can fight it out between yourselves. Um, Mike Rumbles also talked about his own experiences, uh, and, and also um, Colin Smith uh, highlighted the issues of, both the digital, uh, issues of both digital and physical connectivity and how important they are. And Alistair Allen talked about uh, an issue about um, issues about uh, accessing banking and, and the difficulties in the in the islands and the islands community. And again, that is something that uh, I'm very aware of, and it's very extremely important. Um, overall, it's been a very constructive debate and one um, that highlights a number of the issues that the committee um, raised. And in closing, I would like to again thank uh, 
my committee, uh, fellow committee members, those that are still on the committee and have moved on to other responsibilities, and also the clerking team for their excellent work that they've done over the period of the inquiry. And I hope that uh, the positives that have come up in this committee can be taken forward and acted on. Thank you very much. I now call on the Minister of Cape Forms. Thank you, officer. I again start by commending the committee's work to raise the issue of bank branch closures supported by many in the chamber here today. And I welcome the constructive nature of the report, which looked at both the problem and suggested solutions to it. It's critically important that we continue to speak up for our constituents and communities who can feel powerless in the wake of bank closures. And although banking remains reserved, the Scottish Government has a responsibility to ensure that the voices of customers, small businesses and communities are heard at the highest level. And that is a responsibility that we've taken seriously um, over the last few months, particularly in the wake of the particularly damaging branch closures or um, RBS branch closures. So I wanted to pick up on a few themes that we've heard here today. And the first point to pick up on is the vulnerable people who are hit hardest by these branch closures. Gillian Martin talked about the human cost and the importance of social inclusion when it comes to looking at uh, branch closures. And Jackie Bailey highlighted the loyalty of customers, customers who um, are taken for granted by banks because we are less likely to switch banks. And it's older, more vulnerable people in particular who are hit by these branch closures, but not only them. It hits um, the retail sector in particular, who are still um, highly dependent on cash. And it hits ordinary people who suffer the loss and feel that banks are not accountable for the actions that they take. Rachel Hamilton talked about the importance of ensuring that there are alternatives before closing a branch and spoke about taking a gamble on the post office. She also highlighted the powerful story of a, a gentleman in Eyemouth who was caught in out waiting for a mobile branch in particularly awful weather. And the question there about the dignity of uh, customers who are dependent on branches and that face-to-face -face contact. And Fulton McGregor also talked about the lady from Christon who celebrated a uh, hundred years and I saw the picture on Twitter. But again, these people feel like they're being left behind. And it's important that we not only talk about profits when it comes to these branch closures, but also talk about the social needs of customers who feel abandoned. The second theme was around rural areas. And I can certainly empathize because um, as a Highland MSP, I've seen branch closures in my own constituency as well, in Malig, Bewley, Kyle and Aviemore. And in some cases, particularly the one in Bewley, it was the last bank in town. Now that, that is one of the um, 10 branches that have potentially been reprieved, but it awaits to be seen with the outcome of the independent review. And when it comes to rurality, there are significant distances to travel. There was mention of the average of 40 minutes um, of travel in rural areas, but that is an average. And for some, it can be in the region of hours. And as Alistair Allen said, for others, it can be an entire day, depending on ferries there and ferries back to get to uh, South Uist. Um, and if you are taking most of a day to get to your nearest branch, that has obvious implications on uh, work, on a uh, business um, and on other opportunities, whether that's education or training. The third theme was around cash, which is still essential in so many sectors and in so many parts of the country. And Dean Lockhart emphasized the importance of the network of ATMs and the importance of cash in our society. The access to cash and the ability to deposit cash was identified by the committee as a key issue, particularly for small businesses. And it's clear that there will be a continuing long-term need for access to cash banking services in Scotland. The Scottish Government has raised issues on ATM coverage with LINK and the payment system regulator and will continue to do so. And as LINK's changes to the network take effect, 
the impact on the network will become apparent. Now, the PSR has announced that it will take regulatory action requiring LINK to set out explicitly how it will maintain the broad geographic spread of free-to-use ATMs across the UK, and that is vitally important. Keith Brown uh, mentioned the, the promise that was made about um, not leaving if uh, RBS were the last bank in town. And as I've already highlighted from my own constituency example, um, that has not happened. There are cash deserts, as Colin um, Smith has highlighted, where people have no cash access. And they are caught out, whilst it was an amusing story in terms of being caught out with only a card, it can be far more serious when it's more than just a coffee that you're trying to pay for, or when banks, are, or rather businesses, are find themselves without um, cash and in need of cash. And as the FSB highlighted, um, in, that's particularly difficult in areas which have lower than average <coughs> broadband services. So if it's a choice of paying somebody over broadband, which you don't have access to, or cash, um, it, it, you end up with a higher number of people and businesses who become financially excluded. Collaboration is key. Collaboration, particularly that highlighted um, in the discussion between Lewis MacDonald and uh, John Mason, there are other examples where banks work together and there is no reason, albeit with the commercial sensitivities, that they can't work together better uh, on other initiatives, whether that is hubs, whether that's open banking, whether that is um, ensuring that customers ultimately have access. Brian Whittle. Yeah. Hi, Grumbles. Could you tell me, genuine, genuine question, is it, we've heard from the, some of the banks, or certainly I have, that they can't do the hub idea because of regulatory restrictions, and now we know that's reserved for the UK government. Is it actually the case that that is true, or, or could they, on a voluntary nature, engage in, in hubs and communities? I'd like genuinely to know the answer to that. Minister. Well, and I will answer in the spirit that the question was asked, which is, I think to make any of those initiatives work uh, when it comes to collaboration, regulators have to be involved and it needs to be a conversation not just between the banks and not just between government and banks, but also get the regulator involved as well. Because I think regulation needs to be updated as well to recognise the changing needs of customers. Now, there are models that work, like, like the link system, like talking about uh, open banking. Um, and when it comes to hub, the hub system, there will need to be a, you know, considerations when it comes to the regulator for what is, works and what doesn't work. But I don't think that means that we throw out the whole concept of banks sharing um, in an effort to meet the customer needs. So um, it's not just rural communities either. There are, for example, uh, Bonnie Rigg, as, uh, as uh, Colin Beattie mentioned, um, it's not just rural areas where people need to travel further. I, and I find that a, a big disadvantage, particularly when they're dependent on a uh, public transport. And the last point before I close is on consultation. There's been a lot of comment around what real consultation looks like. Stuart McMillan asked that question. Uh, Joan McAlpine talked about the fact that it's too little too late to be having discussions once communities have already taken the brunt of the closure. And that communication needs to be effective with communities and also with representatives who often have to um, answer constituents at surgeries who are deeply concerned about the future of banking provision. So I think there's a, a sense across the chamber of unanimity, of consensus, that the need for physical face-to-face -face banking services and access to cash remains there. There's a need there. Customers deserve choice and there needs to be solutions for all customers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I now ask uh, John Mason to wind up on behalf of the committee? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer, till five o'clock, I assume. Uh, so on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee, and I do congratulate Colin Smith and Brian Whittle, who both got the title right. I think other people were perhaps confused by the fact the report actually says Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, uh, but we do now have a new name. So many thanks to everyone who's contributed to the debate today, the 19 speeches from the 18 speakers. Uh, I find it encouraging that uh, Parliament is as interested as they are in uh, our uh, looking at this subject 
of bank closures. So first of all, I'll touch on some key issues as I see them, and I hope as the committee has seen them, and uh, then maybe, if I've got time, go on to some of the individual uh, contributions we've had. As, as others have said, online and phone banking are all very well, but cash is still needed, and that is stressed in paragraph 19 uh, of our recommendations. Banks are there to serve the public, not just to drive change. Banks are not just an optional extra, like a sweetie shop or the bookies. They are a public service, and a number of members have mentioned that public service, like Brian Whittle, and others, and there is a tension because they're private businesses, but as others have said, they are private businesses that would not exist if the public sector had not bailed them out. A real theme has been the lack of consultation with customers, and Kate Forbes mentioned that, Edward Mountain, Gillian Martin, Stuart McMillan, but then others did as well, and I stopped uh, writing down the notes. And I personally remain unconvinced that this could not happen. I think that's true of the committee as well. It happens in other sectors that there is consultation before a final decision is made, and I believe it could happen in this, which is a public service even run by the, the private sector. Now, when we come to the post office as an alternative, I personally am very positive, and paragraphs 23 to 26 eh, look at this. Eh, I think this is one of the best options going forward, given that we cannot recreate eh, the bank network that we had in the past. I was interested in the post office response, which accepts that there is a lack of awareness and that only 40% of the public uh, realise that they could use uh, the post office for banking services. Uh, I think that was true for the committee that we hadn't realised how much could be done at post office. Uh, and I think there definitely needs to be uh, an increase in that awareness. And I welcome the fact that the post office are committing uh, to uh, raise, do an awareness raising campaign starting, I believe, on the 1st of October. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on one of the groups that went out to visit uh, Leaven along with Colin Beatty, and that was where we were shown a letter from, I believe it was the Royal Bank of Scotland, who were closing their branch in that town, and they only suggested other Royal Banks, and other members have suggested how far away these might be. They did not, in the letter, as far as I could see, mention the post office at all. So there is clearly something very far wrong if we are hoping that the post office is the way forward and the banks will not even tell their own customers that that is an option. And I expect them to go 20 miles an hour, whatever it is, eh, to get to another branch of that bank. So I'm encouraged by parts of the response that we had from the, the post office and especially on awareness raising. Eh, however, I was less happy with what they said about security in their letter. I'm not sure if all members have seen this letter. It was addressed to the convener of the committee. But uh, I, for one, have to say that I feel less comfortable going into a totally open plan a supermarket or whatever where uh, the post office is at one of the tills and we are expected to carry out normal banking services. Now, there are still some post offices. I was at one in Portsmouth in the summer, where there is a separate a place that you go to and do your a post office or banking transactions. And I think a lot of people would be comfortable with that. But the post office even criticized the committee for raising this issue. They suggest that we are, a, that making this claim publicly is an open invitation to the criminal world and threatens the safety of our staff and customers. I mean, how ridiculous is that to get this kind of response from what is meant to be a national organization, the post office? So there, there is a real concern. Many people are really concerned. And I've also heard from uh, local post office owners in my constituency about the tensions they have with the post office as a whole. And I think it was Colin Smith, or no, it was Lewis MacDonald, was it, who mentioned the, the different rates that are paid to the post office as a whole, but how little of that works its way through to the post uh, master or mistress, if that's the correct term. Uh, Rachel Hamilton and Colin Smith both spent quite a lot of time to talking about the post offices, uh, and I think that we had a bit of an interchange around that. It, the only bank that actually contacted me over the summer after the report was published was Lloyds Bank of Scotland, uh, and I agreed to meet them. And, and they were stressing the option of people collecting, uh, people having their money collected, businesses uh, by the bank's collection service. I think that is an option. I think it's something maybe we didn't look at a lot uh, in the report. But clearly, some businesses do not really feel that that is an option. The Treasury response was also a bit of a mixture. 
uh, of positive and uh, negative. Positively, uh, the payment system regulator and the impact on Link, and others have mentioned that the some of the reductions in charges will not be happening. Uh, that is positive and shows that basically the UK government can have an impact on the banking sector in that regard. But more negatively, in relation to the access to banking standard, uh, they say that, quote, they think it is, quote, working effectively at present, unquote. Well, I think the committee was pretty well unanimous in saying that that is not the case. It is not working effectively and it needs to be on a statutory basis. Others have mentioned LINK and the ATMs and uh, we are also concerned, obviously, about losing uh, some of these. But more positively, as I, I was intervened on Lewis MacDonald, it is an example of banks working together and seems to me to show that it could be done and that community hubs or joint branches are a possibility. And the fact that we can almost all get money out of any machine uh, is very positive. Um, just if I can mention my own constituency in passing, we had an RBS in Shettleston and it was very busy. I used it often myself, as Jackie Bailey said, there was often a queue there and uh, yet they announced that it was going to be closed. And I have to be say, say I was so incensed at that time that I did something that I don't think I've ever done before, which was to work with the local Labour Party and specifically, specifically with Margaret Kern and Frank McAviti. And uh, we did a joint campaign led by a community council, I should say, uh, on that point, uh, although we didn't uh, have a lot of success. Now, just to uh, go on to uh, one or two of the um, comments that were made, I'm not going to have time for everybody. Obviously, uh, the convener, Gordon Lindhurst, made a lot of uh, good points. He made a biblical reference, and I was just wondering how I could respond to that. Um, so, there is, of course, the example in the Bible of Jesus turning over the tables of the money changers. So, I thought perhaps he and I could go on a tour of Edinburgh tomorrow and turn over a few tables. Um, the... The, a number of others. Kate Forbes made the interesting point that uh, digital progress should mean it, things are more inclusive and others made the point that there should be more choice rather than less choice, uh, which I would totally agree with. One I definitely wanted to touch on was Mike Rumble's suggestion that uh, a Scottish Parliament committee should do a joint inquiry with a Westminster committee. Well, uh, I'm not sure if that has happened. I'm certainly open to the idea of it although I think there are some practical uh, problems and challenges with that. I think there's also the problem that we have to get the Westminster folk not to look down on us and treat us as equals. Uh, and I have to say, having been there, I do think MPs have a lot more time in their hands than MSPs have. In, conclu in conclusion, presiding officer, I'm delighted that our inquiry has generated this level of interest. Again, many thanks to the witnesses, the speakers, and everyone who's taken part. And I think I can say on behalf of the committee, we will not be forgetting about this topic. We will be keeping an eye on how things develop and may, we may well be back to challenge the different players in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that concludes the, uh, our debate on bank closures on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13984 in the name of Graham Day. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for Thursday, and could I ask any member if they wish to speak against this motion to press their request to speak button now? Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Uh, moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one seems to object, therefore the question is that motion 13984 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 13973 on approval of an SSI. Can I ask Graham Day again on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that motion 13912, in the name of Gordon Lindhurst, on bank closures, impact on local businesses, consumers and the Scottish economy, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question is that motion 13973, in the name of Graham Day, on approval of an SSI, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Bill Kidd on UN International Day of Peace 2018, but we'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats. <laughs>